Balake. Where is Balake at? My name is Blake. Do you want to go to war, Balaki? I'm for real. A.A. Ron. A.A. Ron is present, everyone. I'm here not with Balake, but with Jenna Miscavige. Thank you for joining me, Jenna. Hi. Thanks for having me. I absolutely forgot to pull up your channel and your book. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you know what? We're not in a rush. I'm going to pull it up right now. Oh, my God. You know, dead air makes me so nervous. Have you heard me say that before? What makes you so nervous? Dead air. Silence. Oh, yes, me too. <laughs> it makes me so freaking anxious. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's see. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to ask everybody who's watching on my channel to perhaps open another browser window and open up. We're live streaming to Jenna's channel as well. I told Jenna, I think we can get 4,000 hours of watch time on her channel today, depending on how many people are watching. Um, <clears throat> because that is the threshold for monetization on YouTube. And Jenny, you've already got almost 10,000 subscribers, which is unbelievable. I know. That's amazing. Thank you, everybody. That's so Absolutely awesome. Absolutely incredible. Okay. So, guys, this is Jenna's channel. Oh, oh what's happening? Oh, come on, trackpad. You can do it. Yay. Okay, at Jenna Miscavige. And um, the video on her channel has a different thumbnail and a slightly different title. And I also want to uh, pull up your book real quick, uh, which I have linked in the description down below. So in the description, I do have a link to Jenna's channel and also a link to Jenna's book. Um, it is Beyond Belief. Oops. <clears throat> There it is. 2013. So this was nine. I'm sorry. Ten, ten. years ago. Mm -hmm. Ten years ago. You know, it's funny. You keep telling me how nervous you are to do the videos and stuff. And all I can think of is, what are you talking about? You were on Pierce Morgan. You were on Anderson Cooper. Were you not on The View? Did you go on The View? Yeah, I was. But I was, I was nervous for that. But I wasn't as nervous. I, I guess I felt like at that time, I was just like, whatever, it's too late now. Whatever happens, <laughs> happens. <laughs> but I don't know. For some reason, I'm just more nervous for this. I don't know why. It's live. It's, it's like 10,000 subscribers. I don't, I don't know. Was The View live? Yeah, actually, it was. It was in front of people, but That's right. I don't know. I don't know why. It was very well, short it's... as well. Was it really? To me, the idea of being on a program like that <clears throat> with a live panel where everyone's kind of trying to make a name for themselves and score points or whatever and a live audience and cameras and lights, I feel like I would just freeze up. Was it hard doing that stuff? No, that wasn't hard. I feel more nervous about this because they didn't really know necessarily what they were talking about, you know? <laughs> where like I knew the answers, but it's different in this community where... Everyone's familiar with Scientology. So I'm like, I don't know, just a that's little. An, that's an interesting point. Yeah. If someone who doesn't know anything about Scientology is interviewing you, they can't really do any damage, can they? Like, you yeah. know, there's no, there's no trick question, you know? Yeah. There's no calling you out. Like, yeah. Did anyone try? Like, uh, um, this, this next question is based on having watched Joe Rogan's interview with, uh, Ronnie Sr., who's your grandfather, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it was a very contentious interview. And Joe was like, he was almost trying to catch Ron out. He was almost trying to be like, but aren't you sort of to blame for d how David turned out? And like, it was it was a little like Joe was trying to score points. Was was anyone uh, trying to throw you? Oh, shit. Sorry. Oh, wrong button. Was any did, did anyone try to throw you off in any of those interviews? Or was everyone like over, overly polite? I felt like everyone was so nice, like even uh, behind the scenes, like people were very supportive. They were like, I'm sorry that you've been through this. It's so great that you're here talking about it. Even like just other random celebrities that were there who happened to be on the show that day. Like I think that day, that day Jewel was on the show. And I was like, I, oh, she, my like, God, I, I love Jewel. <laughs> I know. I love her so much. And her interview on Joe Rogan, did you listen to that? 
Yes, she's an incredible interview. So cool. She's so amazing. And she has a book and everything. And after I, I met her, I read it, but obviously I already loved her. But she was like, it's so wonderful that you're doing this. And, um, you know, you should be proud of yourself. Your kids are beautiful. Just everyone was really, really kind. And Anderson Cooper was, was so nice and so supportive. Wow. wow. <sighs> that is incredible. You know, people are always asking in the comment section, what happened to Jenna? Where did Jenna go? And, and it's funny because it uh, like they ask about you, mm -hmm. but what makes it interesting that the question, uh, another layer of interesting to the question is one of the first things that you did was um, you helped create a website called X Scientology kids. Right. And there was two other, two other young women who created that website with you. And it wasn't just you who seemed to kind of disappear, you know, after mm -hmm. the explosion. The other two did as well. I, and I, and I, I haven't mm -hmm. asked you, if, we haven't discussed if anything's on, uh, if anything's off limits. So just let me know if there's anything you don't want to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. Like I never knew Astra Woodcraft. I've never met her. I've never spoken to her. And I have no idea why she's disappeared. What was the name of the third girl who, who started that with you guys? Uh, Kendra. Kendra. Either I think it was Wilkerson or Wilkinson. So she as well. I've never met her. I don't know her. I've never spoken to her. Um, but of course, I know you. And mm -hmm. I always thought it was weird that all three of you sort of seem to drop off, you know, the face of the earth um, for Scientology mm -hmm. purposes, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. And I was told at one point that the reason you had gone quiet is you had some contract with Lifetime for some sort of Lifetime uh, life, uh, you know, um, what do they call it? Lifetime original series or some shit like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I never wanted to pry into any of your shit. Like, I've never contacted you over the years being like, hey, Jenna, what's going on? Because it just seems like such a, a rude thing. Like, some, what, it's not my fucking business. It's your business. But, uh -huh. but like, but what, what happened? What, what, why was it, it seemed like you disappeared? Mm hmm. Um. I, I don't want to say like there wasn't anything specific that happened, um, but I did have a, they were making a lifetime movie at one point, but that didn't wind up happening, but it didn't like prevent me like contractually from speaking. Um, I just, I was going through a lot of things in my personal life and I wasn't like, Oh, I need to stop speaking out or anything like that. But um I just think that it was because I was going through a lot of things in my personal life. Um, and I have been going through a lot of things in my personal life over the last few years, um, including divorce that have sort of made me question everything that I believe to be true about myself, like that I am strong. I've learned my lesson. I would never be controlled again. I escaped but I feel like as it turns out like I don't know I've just realized that these things aren't necessarily true and that in reality because of the way that I was I was brought up in Scientology um, I was actually extremely susceptible to being manipulated and gaslit and controlled and um, without even realizing it because that's how I was that's how I was brought up being treated. And I feel like during this time period when I wasn't really speaking out, um, it was kind of because I believed that the only thing that was valuable or important about me was that I was a mother to my kids and that my only um, value was through raising them. And I guess I was like in an environment where um, my value as a person, my achievements, my bravery um, through speaking out was belittled and uh, standing up for myself and for other people was equivalent to being a drama queen and trying to get attention. And I was, during this time I was treated this way by people who I was required to spend large quantities of time with and for many, many years. And I just feel like I became less and less myself. And um, it came to a point where I was policing myself to be this like easygoing, um, likable person who was good enough for people who 
didn't think I was good enough. And um, I feel like um, after my kids getting a little bit older and getting some therapy and having some independence through having my own business, I realized that this was that I wasn't happy in that environment because it wasn't in alignment with my values and that I didn't value myself for being um, likable or being easygoing or drama free. But my values are that I am a loyal person, that I'm brave and I have empathy for people and that I naturally feel a need to stand up for th- stand up for people who I feel who are oppressed and um yeah so it's just about coming back to being that person who I initially was and also like recently um I think as I was coming back unto myself I saw um my friend Valeska's case in the news and she was somebody who had grown up in a very similar way to me. She was my good friend. I've known her since I was nine. And just something about her case being sent to, like her being sent to Scientology arbitration, just like, just like really pissed me off. (laughs) And it like just kind of lit a fire in me that, I don't know. It like just made me like kind of realize what's important to me and who I am and that this is what I want to be a part of this community that's um, yeah, that helps um, people who have been brave enough to speak out and who have grown up in Scientology to um, feel heard and to be cared for. And um, you know, it's, it's not all over once you leave. It's actually life can be quite difficult afterwards. So anything that I can do to help make that easier for people who are going through the same thing as me, um, I don't know. I feel like that's back to top of my mind now. Wow. So you mean like the struggle isn't over when you leave? I mean, just because you've left doesn't mean there's no, nothing more that needs to be done. Is that what you mean? Yes. Like it's not like you're instantly free and all, all the everything you've been living through for years that the pain of it goes away. I mean, usually you're dealing with being ostracized from everyone who you ever knew your entire life. So, um, on top of that, like in my case, um, family members are very much against me speaking out about Scientology. Um, and that's so hard. Like it take it's so hard to get out in the first place and then to feel like you're wrong or bad for speaking out about it. It's like, the worst thing that can possibly happen when someone's leaving a cult, you know? And, you know, in many cases, people leave, they don't have an education. Like I don't have a high school diploma, don't have a GED, never went to college. And you lose your connections that you had, you know, in this little Scientology environment have no connections. So it actually takes a lot of work to get your life together and get going, not to mention other things like parenting. What examples are you going off of? You know, nobody teaches you how to be a parent. You got to figure it out yourself. Was that, I'm curious because I only have the the male perspective on that Mm -hmm. of, and and I'm raising, you know, three girls. Mm -hmm. Um, It's true. When you're trying to be a parent, what do you have to model yourself after other than your own experience? And then I've always felt like as long as I'm trying to do better, (laughs) <laughs> then was done to me. I'm at least going in, in the right direction. But you as a mother, how mm-hmm. did you how did you model that? How did you approach that? Yeah, that's such a good question. I mean, I think that I it caused me a lot of anxiety because I was like so like paranoid about like repeating a cycle that I like held myself to like such a high standard. I was like, um, But I think that um, I actually think in many ways it did give me an opportunity to be a little bit better of a parent than maybe I would have been otherwise because I knew how it felt on the other side if, you know, you were belittled or ignored or whatever. So I guess I knew what to watch out for. Um, 
but yeah, it's hard. And it's also weirdly healing because for some reason, um, giving what you didn't have to these little people, I don't know, like it felt like I was like giving it to myself, you know, or I don't know, for some reason, it felt like comforting to be able to give that even though I didn't have it. Um, but also, in many ways, it was very, um, like when something happens to you, you can be like, Oh, I was fine. I'm fine. But like, when you look at how old, like, when your kids are the same age that you were and certain things happened, it's hard not to be like, oh, that was fucked up. That is really messed up. And it, and it gives you another perspective on that as well. Yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, your experience and other people who were um, born and raised at the Int Ranch, were you, were you actually born at Int? I mean, I don't want to side, segue too quickly into... Um, That's okay. Were, for for most of your childhood, though, you were up at the Int Ranch. It's it's this area um, separate from the international base where they kept the kids of the Sierra members who worked at the Int base. Was was that most of your childhood experience being separated from your parents? Did you see them every day, once a day? Right. Yeah. So, like, my parents joined rejoined the Sea Org when I was right before I was two, and so we were actually in LA from when I was two till I was six. And my dad worked at Incom at PAC. Okay. I didn't know if you wanted to explain that. Or you, it's okay. It's okay. Okay, cool. And then my, at first there was like family time where we could um, like, I think it was like after four o'clock, we could like see our parents for a few hours. But then like by the time I was four, like that was canceled and my mom would be actually gone for like, six months at a time because she was at the free winds she was like responsible for the renovation so she was away and my dad had gone up to the int base so like by the time I was four I was seeing them like once a week and then I went to the ranch when I was six and then I was there until I was 12. So when when I met you <clears throat> when you came to flag in like 93. Yeah. Did you come to flag right from the ranch or were you ever actually at gold or at int? I was never at Gold or Int, but I was often there on the base, mm. either taking a course or a lot of times the kids would be used to work in the galley. And so like I would <laughs> yeah, I've never like, heard anyone time. I've never heard anyone say that before. I didn't know that. <laughs> they would bring the cadets over to work in the damn galley. Yeah, yeah. That was fun work for us because the alternative was like digging ditches and hauling rocks. I'd much uh. rather work in the bakery and make cookies. Then be it's at the true. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I mean, kids like being put to work. I mean, that's just that's just truth, right? Well, it was just easier Depending. than the work at the ranch. Yeah. And yeah, and then actually, like before the golden age of tech, we were we helped to make all the e meters, the quantum e meters. So <laughs> we were like part of that whole assembly line. The kids, you were the kids were making yeah, e meters. Yeah. No wonder everyone was rock slamming on those things. <laughs> <laughs> there's, like, there's some gum in the emitter. Oh, yeah, but like, when I met you, so I was at the ranch from from 1990 until 1996. But my mom was at Flag for the vast ma the vast majority of that time. Actually, before that, she was at CC because she was doing that project. Basically, she was always away. I would see my dad once a week, and my mom was either was was away. So when I saw you at flag on key to life um it was because i was visiting my mom oh yeah right yeah yeah because i remember you had one of the black cmo went name tags <clears throat> that i was so always so jealous of as as a little scientology kid i was like jealous of the strangest shit i i was infatuated with people at int and going to int and learning all about int and i remember you were yeah. like don't you dare try to find out where it is <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah, yeah. I remember because it's like supposed to be a big secret. And then at some point it like came out in that newspaper. <laughs> I, I wouldn't like, even oh. know. I mean, I wouldn't know. <laughs> oh, it was when we were in and it was like an article on Dave and he said in it where Int was and it, we were all supposed to read it. And I was like, huh? 
like this is the secrets out now he's allowed to tell everyone knows <laughs> but that was much later on but um yeah but i think maybe you're thinking of me wearing that uniform at a later time because at that time i was just like a cadet and i was just wearing like well for lack of a better word civvies maybe you're <laughs> right maybe you're right yeah um it's funny that you would have been on the key to life course while just visiting your mom. I guess that's why I like, I never knew you were just there visiting your mom. Yeah. And to this day, I don't think I've ever spoken one word to your mom. Obviously I knew who she was. She was WDCFLB during mm -hmm. the training program. Um, <clears throat> so I know who she was, but I've never met her or spoken to her or anything. Um, okay. So I thought, I thought you showed up cause they had kicked all the kids out of they, uh, they had just kicked all the kids out of int or whatever, but that, that's not quite how that went down. That's a different thing. So oh. like, yeah, so I went back to the ranch and then I actually came to visit Flag again. And then I permanently came to Flag on my own in 96 by myself. Neither of my parents were there. Oh. I was like sent after, there. After the Golden Age of Tech or before? Like after, after May? Like right after the Golden Age of Tech. Oh, so, so I like, would have been I would have been gone. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, all right. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. But, but you remember, and, and I didn't mean to get you sidetracked into this stuff that probably. No, that's okay. It's not sidetracked. Yeah. But you remember, like, I still think so back fondly about Diane Rhodes and Sophie Amiel. And oh, yeah, that's and, right. And um, Andres Gutierrez was the little folder page who, for some reason, was on Key Life at that time. And um, Sherry Cepelina was a word clear. She's still oh, in New yeah. York, but I remember her. And Nikki Erickson and Tony Torito yes. and Mary Pesh and Adriana oh, Suaco. And Gayla Aguirre. I, I, I mean, That's for me right. as a kid or whatever, those were still good times. Those were still good times in Scientology. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. For me, that was really good because it was so much better being there than at the ranch. Yeah. Like. It, it, so it's funny you make that comparison because, you know, I was talking to Sterling, who's your brother. Mm -hmm. uh, for Of course, you know, he's your brother. But everyone, Sterling Tompkins is Jenna's brother. And it's funny because when he speaks fondly of the ranch, he the int ranch, he's speaking mm -hmm. fondly of it because it was so much better than his life in L.A. Mm -hmm. before he was sent to the ranch. So for him, it was like, oh, this is so much better. And so he has these fond memories about it is that how yeah. flag was for you when you first got there well it was like that but i wasn't required to like do any job other than do key to life uh -huh. so just to do be in that classroom all day which that was the first time i had like encountered like a uh, scientology public and um like wow that's funny to consider you'd never yeah. seen anyone but Sea Org members your whole life right exactly yeah and so oh. it was just like a different world. It was like a different place. The weather was different. It was like sunny. And then like I would go have lunch with my mom. So I would see her every day. They had like the best food. Everyone was nice to me. Didn't have to work. And I would like go home at night and sleep in my bed. And that was when I actually met Valeska because Valeska was she would like she was like 16, but she like did the laundry of all the executives, like my mom, her assistant, all the other, like Tom Devot, all those people. She did all their laundry, um, brought them food, cleaned their offices, cleaned their bedrooms. And so she was like responsible for like watching me, the psychopath. <laughs> and we became really good friends. Was she in CMO or flag crew? She was in CMO. Okay, okay. I was just trying to think, like, because also I if, if and I might be getting dates and times confused because wasn't Val Haney also like the exec steward in the Clearwater Building in the exec dining room? Am I getting that wrong? No, she was, but that's different because that's like in Flag Crew. That's Flag Crew. Yeah. Okay, and I couldn't remember if Valeska had also been one of those um, exec stewards in Flag Crew or if she had was with the execs because she was in CMO. So she was with the execs because she was in CMO and then got kicked out of CMO because of the situation with her parents or with her mom or her mom's husband being anti-Scientology. And right. then she was in Flag Crew where she worked with Valerie. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
Um, the reason I got onto that segue is because it's just amazing to consider that like your childhood Scientology experience is even completely different than mine. And I think it's important for people to understand that, like your uh, like why people have such different stories and different perspectives and different opinions and shit is because the right. experience can be so, so hugely different. You as a child in Scientology, were lucky to see your parents once a week. Right. And usually it was I just was, my dad. It was just I, my dad because my like usually I just saw my dad because my mom was away all the time for years at a time. Yeah. That like it's very hard for me to imagine what that would be like you know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and how I almost don't know what the right words are. I want to say like dehumanizing, but it's not the right word. Like to, to just think that these kids are basically just treated like cattle. Like it's not even important to the organization that they feel loved and seen by their parents. Like they're just, they're just there as like, eh, we'll put up with them until they're old enough to work kind of, kind of bullshit. And it's, it's so, I mean, now that you have kids of your own, I have kids of my own. It's unfathomable to right. me. Yeah. That, that anyone would, would be okay with that, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think like, for me, that's all I've experienced, but like, I've also experienced being a mom. So, I, you know, I guess you hear of how other people's lives are, but unless you experience, I think it's easy for someone like Sterling to say, oh, the ranch was so great. You know, it was better than LA, but we still did not live with our parents. We only saw our parents once a week. Sterling was actually at the ranch for like maybe a year or maybe two years. So he was there and then he went to the int base to work there after. So when I first came to the ranch, it was like wild and free for the first few months. It was like, oh, um, like we slept in a tent inside a room, like, and like, I remember I, I went to the ranch with, with Mike Rinder's son, Benjamin, and we like slept in the same dorm. And then slowly, you know, everything became, you know, there was many more rules, of course, girls dorms, boys dorms, everything was separate, but there were a few months of freedom that where everything was, when everything was first getting started, but it became you know, very regulated and just an experience that Sterling would have would be very different from mine. Cause like we didn't have like grades or anything. So there weren't, there wasn't separation between the kids. So like when Sterling was playing sports, like I was on the same team of sports and Sterling is like nearly eight years older than me. And I was just like <laughs> terrified, terrified of being like trampled by these like <clears throat> way older dudes. And so it wasn't that fun for me. <laughs> So you're like an, an eight-year-old playing football with 15-year-old boys? Yeah, <laughs> or exactly, whatever. yeah. Or like, yeah, or like a six-year-old. I was six when I first went to the ranch. Oh, my God. <laughs> I can see Sterling being like, okay, Jen is the weak point on the line. Run right through her. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, it would be like, I would always be getting yelled at, like, get it, get, get it. I'd be like, ah, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god does it just blow your mind that like kids you knew back then like ben rinder are still in the fucking sea org yeah it's pretty crazy i mean i guess i know how it was when i was there but i don't know it seems like it's um so much easier to get out these days like there's so much more information out there um, I don't know, you, you should be so much smarter now because you've grown up. I mean, that I, I felt like that made a big difference for me just getting older, coming to an age where I, uh, I don't know, where I was more mature. So I don't know. I don't, I don't fully understand it. Um, I think I want to pick your brain on this subject a little bit because um mm -hmm. I want to know if you agree with an opinion that I have about someone like Ben specifically and, and, and a few others like him. Mm -hmm. If I'm David Miscavige mm -hmm. and I want to be really, really smart, and it's weird because some people will tell will say that Miscavige really is when it comes to strategy and when it comes to thinking like, uh, you know, almost genius. And, and then I go, what are you talking about? All of his Scientology strategies have failed utterly. How is he a fucking genius? But here's where I'm going with this. If I'm Miscavige and I want to be really fucking smart, 
mm-hmm. and there's someone you really, really, really don't want to leave the Sea Org. Mm-hmm. What is the best way to make sure that person doesn't leave? It's to make sure they don't want to leave. What's the best way to make sure they don't want to leave? To make sure they're actually fucking happy to the degree that you can be in the Sea Org. Make yeah. sure they're not treat. Make sure they're given libs every other week. Make sure they're they they don't have their pay skipped. Make sure you know they're not separated from their spouse. So I feel mm-hmm. if Miscavige is being smart, that the reason Ben is still in the Sea Org is because he's put Ben on a cushy post. He's given him a nice birthing. He's Mm -hmm. made sure his senior isn't a dick to him. Make Mm -hmm. sure he gets his libs. Because if you're in the Sea Org, you're already as dedicated as can be. All you have to do is not be treated like total horse shit. And chances are you'll stay there forever. Do you think Mm -hmm. that's a naive way of thinking that like that, 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 well, that your uncle Dave would be smart enough to use that strategy to keep Ben Rinder in the Sea Org? Or do you think it's more likely he's just scared the shit out of Ben that he'll end up homeless on the street if he ever leaves or some shit like that? Like, what what, what rings truer to you? I mean, I don't think it's naive at all. I think that if I were in Dave's position, that's what I would be thinking. That's what I would be doing. Yeah. But um, I don't know. They didn't really do that with me, though. And that's so, why I wanted to pick your brain about it. Cause yeah, I go, yeah. you think you'd want to keep Jenna from leaving too, right? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but I think I was a lot more trouble than he is. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it's different in that way. Okay. But um, I, I don't know though. I also wouldn't have been so much trouble if they hadn't been like asking for it constantly, if they would have just left me alone. So I don't know. Maybe they've learned from that. But what you're saying makes sense, you know, and actually um, when when Mike initially left, I I left before Mike, but when Mike initially left, I actually called at flag and I spoke to Benjamin. I had to like pretend like I was someone else and I spoke to him and I said, hey, I had never done it before, but I like took this chance and I felt like it could only work once. But I was like, hey, you know, your dad left and um, I just wanted to tell you, like, if you need help leaving or if you wanted to be with him, I wanted you to know. And um, wow. he, when I was speaking to him, he basically said, he said um, he doesn't have a close relationship with his dad, which is true. I lived like, well, we, I, we didn't live together cause we lived at the ranch, but when we would go home to where our parents lived once a week, um, we would always go together. And I was always close with Benjamin. He was like my brother to me, basically. We were always grouped together for some reason, but he said that he was at that time, he said, I'm able to do some of the things that I want to do. Like I'm able to do my drawing and I made like, I'm, allowed to have time off so even at that time he was thinking that he was able to have some sort of freedom and he said um he was like you know if you weren't here for me when you were at flag I would and at the ranch I would have been a mess and so I like really treasured those times and then that was the last time I've ever spoken to him and then like after that like I don't it was probably like a few months later, it was like when I was speaking out, I like got a call from Kathy Rinder. One day as I was leaving work, I was like with a coworker, we were just talking and I answered my phone and it was like this voice that was like, Bleh. I was like, leave Benjamin alone. It was like, he hates you. You are a suppressive person. It was like, like the voice of like an insane person. And I was like, and then the person who I was with was like, are you okay? (laughs) So yeah, that's, so when I I spoke to him. Was she responding to you having called her or was uh, you having called Ben or was this uh, like way in the future after that? It was like a little bit in the future. Like at least like, to be honest, I don't remember how far in the future, but it was like at least a month or two or more. Ben must have been pulled into some ethics interview and finally told someone that you'd called him. Exactly. Huh? Yeah, exactly. Cause it was like, kind of like out of nowhere. Yeah. But, yeah. Wow. 
Um, but it's true. Like, it's true that he didn't have a close relationship with Mike. Just like by the time your parents left the Sea Org, mm -hmm. you refused to go with them because you didn't have a close relationship with them, right? Right. It's true. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I feel like, um, you know, in the regular world, like people are like, oh, that's your mom or, oh, that's your dad. Like, how can you have a falling out? But I, I literally, well, I guess I did before I was two, but I literally never lived in a house with my parents or with my brothers. And wow. it wasn't like if something like I, I couldn't even like maybe if my mom called once during the week, I could talk to her in an office with other adults there. We sent like weekly reports to our parents, which was a form that we filled out that was checked by adults. And every letter that we got was opened. So it wasn't like, it was never like your parents were somebody who you could go to if you were having trouble or somebody who would protect you if something bad was happening. Wow. That just wasn't a thing. They weren't the people who fed you. They weren't the people who were there when you were sick. Um, those were other cadets, really. I've never heard anyone mention the weekly report You'd send, was this a weekly report specifically that cadets were to send to their parents? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And was it like, here's how productive I was this week? Or was it like your weekly, uh, was it specifically supposed to be like production oriented or was it supposed to be personal communication? It was a form, but it was like, I had fun doing this. I worked on this projects this week. Like you could write, you could fill it out as you wanted. But it was like there was a space for I accomplished this in my studies. I accomplished this on my job. I accomplished this on the decks or whatever. And like you could write, I love you and I hope we do this when I see you. But the re in reality, like the amount of time we saw them on the weekend, like if we would go to their birthing, my dad would get home at like midnight and he would wake up at like, say, nine o'clock. By 11 o'clock, we already had to be driving back to the ranch. So it wasn't a weekend together. And it wasn't like a whole day once a week. It was like a couple of hours. Wow. Although I will say that my dad did come visit me every Friday morning at the ranch. Because it was on Friday. So I guess like he was doing like the stats the international, I don't know what they were doing. Like, cause you know how the week ends on Thursday at two. Yeah. So like he was doing like some statistical evolution overnight for the international statistics. So he was allowed to sleep in that day and on Friday until like noon. And then in, so he would come visit me at the ranch. He would be there for like 30 minutes, but no one else's parents did. Wow. <clears throat> it's funny if someone were to say, Oh, as Miscavige's, you probably had more freedoms and whatever is I'd probably go. Yeah, that makes sense. But if someone also said, Oh, as Miscavige's, you were held to a much higher standard and things were much more difficult. I'd go. Yeah, that makes sense. W which one of those was more true in your experience? Um, I do think that people were nicer to me initially because of my name. Like people were, I don't know, maybe would be kinder to me at first or like when all of the outer trainees were at flag, like I was like always just so excited to meet everybody. And like they would tell me about their different countries they were from. I don't know if they were like that to everybody. I mean, I, I thought that they were nice to everybody or even at the int base, like when I would like walk through the dining room, people would be like, hi, Jenna. And but like other people would be like, oh, they're just like kissing your butt but i would be like but it's stephanie i love her and i would like go talk to her so i don't know maybe that's i guess maybe everyone didn't have that um but i mean i was on the same schedule as all the kids at the ranch you know i had a job like my job was groundsman like i didn't it's not like i had an important po important post like literally ever so but yeah, I was definitely held to a higher standard because like anything I did was like 
seen to be like embarrassing uh -huh. or like looked bad on my family. Hmm. But like, for example, when you say in 93, <clears throat> you went to flag mm -hmm. really just to visit your mom and you got to be on course all the time and then eat at the restaurant right. and everything. Like, why did they let you do that? That's true. That is in some ways special treatment, although in some ways not because most people got to see both of their parents every week. Uh, most people didn't have a mom that was gone right. all the time, you know? So, but, but I actually pretty much was though. Um, and sorry, what were you saying? Like, um, <clears throat> well, I was asking, how did it come to be that they let you be like, oh yeah, you can just go to Clearwater and almost be on like a, a vacation for yeah, a while. Um, totally. And it was like that. I mean, I mean, I was on course like all day, but, um, yeah, I think my mom was like, this is what's happening. And nobody, nobody, everybody was too afraid to, to ask questions. That probably is what it was, right? Yeah. She's like, yeah. you're sending me to flag. You're sending Jenna down to spend time with me. Yeah. <clears throat> After she was there for a long time though. Like, yeah. 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 <sighs> I I never knew. So like after I left flag in 96, um, mm -hmm. I went back in 98 for like six months. I don't have distinct memories of, of interacting with you at that time. Fast forward to 2002. I, I'm in the Sea Organ, Los Angeles. You're there. You're at middle management. I've literally never even had a chance to ask you how the hell you ended up at middle management instead of back at Int. Is there a story there? Um. Yeah. So so then in 96 to 2000, I was at flag. And then in 2000, just like kind of out of nowhere, I like gotten pulled into like a sec check with Ann Rathbun. Um, and then at first she was just like asking me weird questions. Like from when I was a kid, like she was like, do you remember this coin collection your parents had? And I was like, yeah and I was and then she like was like asking me where it was and I was like I don't know like and then like is um, this because they'd blown yeah but I didn't know and so for several months like at first it was just like innocent like that and then and then I like it became that I had to get sec checked like for several hours a day then it became that I had to clean the bathroom all day and then it became that I had to sleep in a separate room and I had to be on watch day and night somebody slept outside or somebody was awake outside the apartment door when I was sleeping and then it became like I had to clean the bathroom literally all day if I wasn't listening to the state of man congress lectures or being in a sec check with Ann Rathbun and like like many times I had to eat in the bathroom because my uncle was like going through the hallway and I would be, I would like interbulate him if he had to see me. So I just like, and by uncle, you mean David Miscavige. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they have you eating your meal in the bathroom so that David Miscavige doesn't see you and get upset by your presence. Right. Yeah. By the way, I didn't even know why this was happening at the time. Like at the time I, I didn't like, I didn't even do anything particularly bad. So, I mean, I, I think at any given moment, you can think of like a hundred overts that you could have done, but I didn't really do anything bad. And then finally, after several months, they were like, okay, you are going to, Ann Rathbun told me that, okay, you are going to go home tomorrow. And I was like, what's home? And she was like, back to Int. You're going on a flight. And I was like, why? And she's like, I don't, you're going to find out what's happening and I was like, okay, I just thought I was in trouble for something that I had done. Anyways, and then I um, arrived, like, so then I went on a flight to LA, never got to say goodbye to any of my friends, never got to say goodbye to my grandma, Was and then they said I would be coming back. And I was like, okay, well, I'll just bring some of my stuff. And they were like, no, just bring all of it just in case. And I was like, okay. And then, so I was just put on a plane and then I arrived in LA at the airport and I was picked up by this gal in Osa who I happened to know because she was the mom of another kid at the ranch. 
and then I was brought to the the HGB um and to like the top floor of it and that and then um Mike and Marty were there and they basically told me that my parents had left and that I was supposed to go with them and that they were in Mexico they were in Cabo San Lucas and I was supposed to go like be with them both of your parents left the Sea Org and without you knowing it and having left you behind in Clearwater. Yeah, well, it's my understanding that they were told that I was going to be going with them. Okay. Yeah. But by the time they left, got on a plane, went to Mexico, you were still in Scientology's custody and had no idea they had left. Right. Yeah, I didn't know so until fucking bonkers yeah i didn't know until i was like in that room and they told me and i was like okay that's why all this has been happening that's why i was asked these random questions and and yeah and that's why i had been getting sec checked fp fprd sec checked by ann rathbun at what at what age would you have been at this time i was 16 oh my god I mean, oh, my God. I mean, I know a lot of people don't fully understand the context of this, but it's like, you know, for those of you watching who may not fully understand the framing of all this, like, you, so, so Jen is being subjected to, to these procedures that are highly punitive, like getting a sex check, a security check. That's the interrogation style of auditing. Uh, doing it FPRD style is, is particularly more uh, cumbersome and onerous style of sex checking. Um uh, being put on uh, messed work, like physical labor, cleaning bathrooms and shit. That's what you do when you're in trouble. So this whole time, you think you're in trouble. You've done something wrong. I would be so fucking furious if I found out I'd been subjected to all this just because my parents left and nobody bothered to tell me. I'd be fucking furious. Yeah. I think that I was like, I was like, just like, scared that I was going to have to leave everybody that I had ever known, like all of my friends at flag that I would never see them again. And at that point, my parents were people who I hadn't seen for the last four years. I'd seen them maybe like I had seen my mom once in the last four years. Wow. And I'd seen my dad, like I maybe saw my dad, my mom for like half an hour once in those four years. So from when I was 12 till I was 16, wow. I didn't see her and I wasn't allowed to call her. And every letter I got from her was handed to me by Ann Rathbun and was then taken back. Like, so I couldn't like, I had to read it in front of her. And then, it was like eyes only. Yes. Cause it talked about the int base or it had photos of what she was doing as out security. Wow. And so I couldn't like even like read it later by myself at night. And I saw my dad like just a couple times in those years. And even before that, it was like, I'd just seen them once a week since I was four. So it was kind of weird. It was like, I was constantly told that family wasn't important and that they were just like family members. Like I was told even by, my aunt Shelly that like, you know, no Thetan is the parent of another Thetan or the child of another Thetan. And that, um, that, you know, my dad had been wrong because he always put so much value on the second dynamic. And that was one of his big issues. No. Yeah. Yeah. She fully told me that. Yeah. Like coming to see you every Friday. Yeah. And he would, my dad would like write me constantly. Like I feel bad in retrospect as a parent, but he would like write me constantly when I was at five and I feel bad because you look sad, but I was like, can he stop writing? <laughs> but I wasn't allowed to call him and he would, he really wanted me to call him and would get upset that I wouldn't. But then I would get told by like Shelly, like I got in huge trouble. I was told that I was the only person on the entire base who was, allowed or who had called the int base for security reasons other than Dave and that I was calling them because I thought I was that I should get special treatment 
When in fact, all of the other kids from the in, in ranch who were there, they were calling their parents every week. Wow. So, um, yeah. So I, I, I don't know. Like I, I didn't really have a relationship with my parents at that point. So like, Shelly Miscavige is literally trying to get you to stop trying to treat your parents like they're your parents. Mm -hmm. Like, 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 like by even trying to constantly contact your parents as parents, she's saying you seem to expect special treatment. Right. Mm -hmm. Fuck. Yeah. I'm so glad I wasn't raised in the Sea Org. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'd be all sorts of more fucked up than I already am. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even at one point, like uh, even prior to this, when I was in trouble, I did try to call my parents, which was like a weird move. Like normally I would never try to call my parents, but it was like, I was like desperate. Like I, and I was at the Hacienda, which is the birthing for the Sea Org members at, in Florida at flag. And, um, I like literally got held down by a security guard there and three other women like was like fully prevented from calling my parents. I was only like 15 at this point. Wow. Yeah. So that was a big thing for them. I don't, it was, it was the way it was put to me was that it was out security for me to be calling the int base. Oh, security. It's incredible. <clears throat> I mean, your dad, Ronnie, Ronnie, Ronnie Miscavige Jr., you know, uh, senior international executive. Was he marketing executive for pretty much your entire life? Yeah. It's amazing to me that someone at that high level of international management could be almost like if you were to look into his ethics file, it would say something like is too fixated on family, seems to be fixated on family as <laughs> if. That's a red flag. Mm -hmm. He's other intentioned. He's off purpose. Yeah. He's not with the program. He, he wants to visit his daughter too many times. What's wrong with this guy? <laughs> yeah. Oh, fuck. That's a real mind fuck. Yeah. And it's crazy that, you know, when your mom was sent to flag, you know, early on in like the pre-96 era, she's mm -hmm. like, Jen has got to come here. But then once you were there, what did she go back to Int? You said you didn't see her for four years. Did she go back to Int? Oh, so like, um, yeah, she was a back at Int. And then I had been sent to Flag to get training. And she was no longer at Flag at that time. And so it was a totally different experience. I thought I was going to be getting this nice, great treatment that I had gotten when my mom was there and that I could like go on course and eat and, and sleep in the nice bed in her apartment and get snacks but no the second i got there i was like put into a regular birthing and um with people who i didn't know and i was um like there was like no sheets on the bed and i like didn't know where to get sheets and then i was like told like you're in the sea org now like here's your uniform and and so i was like in cmo cw all of a sudden like i didn't at that point i didn't do my epf I didn't know this was going to happen. I was just like, it was like, you're in the Sea Org now. Here's your uniform and figure it out. And actually at that time, Valeska was still there, but she was in flag crew. And she was the only person I knew who was like my friend. And well, I mean, I knew other people like in, like in FSO, but, um, but like, I was like, like at that point I was only 12. Like I was afraid to sleep in my bed by myself at night. I had like terrible, like I was so afraid at night as a kid. And so I would like go and sleep in Valeska's room and she would like help me like get my uniform in order and stuff. And like, I would, I was like, didn't like know what I was supposed to be doing. Like I was supposed to be eating with CMO, but I didn't have a table. So I would like eat with Valeska after like, cause she was like a steward in the CB. So I would like, just like eat with her and I would like, yeah. And then she got sent to the ship. Right. And so then she was gone. 
why didn't they send you back to Int when your mom went to Int? What, 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 what? I almost feel like there must there was some like, you know, without knowing the details, I feel like behind the scenes there must have been some sort of punitive nature. Like, let's make sure Jenna understands her place in the pecking order, and she's a like. Was it punitive? I, I mean, what did they tell you? Well, so just so it's clear, my mom was already back at Int, and so was I working in the e meter. Like before the Golden Age of Tech, that's when we were making the e meters. Hmm. It's like called HEM. It's Hubbard e meter manufacturing. So all the cadets were working there. We were like part of the assembly line. My mom was back at in with me. And then I was sent to flag. Oh. Yeah. So it wasn't like I had been there that whole time. I had like when I saw when I saw you at flag, I went to visit my mom for a couple months, then went back to the ranch for a year and then came back for a couple months again, was with my mom and then went back to the ranch for a year. Wow. So I only permanently went to flag in 96 and I was by myself the I whole time. It. I got it. And, <clears throat> and it was at the end of that stint when your folks left, you were put on this sec checking and, you know, labor and then went to LA, found out that your parents were in Cabo San Lucas. Um, and uh, did I say that right? Cabo, Cabo? Yes. And, yeah. and you were not Just married yet, right? Right. No, I was just oh, 16. See, see, I didn't, I, I, in my mind, I, I never knew the, how all, you know, the timeline of it and how everything fit together. I thought that your parents were like expecting you to like leave the Sea Org and your husband to leave with them. And you'd be like, why the fuck would I do that? That's so stupid. But you were just a young single girl in the Sea Org mm -hmm. who knew the Sea Org and people in the Sea Org better than you knew your parents in the outside world. And you were like, you were basically almost told you're leaving. You don't have a choice. You're leaving. And you're like, I'm not leaving. Right. Yeah, pretty much. It's true. Wow. Yeah. Like it was my choice as much as you can call something like someone who was brainwashed, like had been there, whatever. And also it was like, you know, like everything we'd been told about outside schools were that like, they like put you on psych drugs. And I was like, I was actually like behind in school because we were only allowed to do school one day a week at flag. And um, like, and then I was like always in trouble. So I would like not be allowed to go to school. And because of the time that I had spent at flag when I was, when I saw you, like that was time away from school. And so I was like, just so afraid that it would be so embarrassing to go to regular school and then, like they didn't speak English. And I was just like, I was afraid I had never been around wogs. So the whole outside world was like scary to me. It's like a, a whole other thing. So it wasn't just my parents. It was like, there was so many other, it was losing everybody I ever knew, not really feeling like I had a relationship with my parents, being afraid of psych drugs, being afraid of the wog world and going to Mexico. Oh, just, right, because it's Mexico. Why the fuck was it Mexico? <laughs> Probably because they just wanted uh, the Miscavages as far away from, you know, Scientology as possible, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, <clears throat> out of the country. And, I, and like how my dad explains it is that like they could have given him a ticket to anywhere and he would have been like, let's go. I'm great. I'll go there now. <laughs> totally. <laughs> It'd be like, Russia? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That's right. Because if you left the Sea Org at that time, you'd be in fucking high school. Right. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. Wow. Why did they keep you at middle management instead of sending you back to Flag or sending you to Ent? I think that it was because, like, I was, like, technically, I guess, PTS. <laughs> Like, so having me at flag would like endanger flag, probably like it was like the whole thing was like Lisa McPherson was at flag and she was PTS. And so she created this whole trouble by dying, I guess she created trouble by dying. Like, <laughs> and so it was like that base was too important for like me to be there, I guess. I can't tell you how funny that is to me to consider that some genius was like, uh, yeah, it's too sensitive for her to be at flag, but you know where she should be? Middle management, which is technically senior to flag. Right. I mean, yeah. Technically, right? Except yeah. David Miscavige treats flag like it's his little baby, and that's not true for middle, middle management, right? Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. <clears throat> so I was like, when I was there at FLO or middle management, I was um, like, I was with the RTC reps. I was with two RTC reps all day for like going on six months. I would eat with them. I slept in a room by myself and I would um, go to the office there and I would have to do the PTSSP course in a room by myself. And then all of the drills I would have to do with Tracy Danilovich, Tracy oh, Orchu. Wow. I remember Dick Orchu from Flag. I know. Um, and um, she would do all the drills with me. And then I like would have to like ask to go to the bathroom because there was like key, like, I don't know what it's called. The, like the key cards. Yeah. To go like, to, if so if I left the floor, like, so someone would have to escort me to the bathroom and back. I sat at her table and ate with her only wow. for several months until I finished the PTSSP course. Did you feel like they sort of were giving you props? Like they had respect for you for choosing to stay or were they like, ah, oh, fuck now we got to deal with her. I do think that it was probably like a little bit of both, but I do think that they were like, like, I do remember that it says it in my book, but like at the time, Mike was like, wow, you are such a dedicated Sea Org member. <laughs> and I was like, wow, I am. <laughs> So, by the way, who was the other RTC rep that you spent so much time with? Um, it was Elsie Tucker or Elsie Ben Rhyme. Elsie Tucker and Melanie Peeler were two of my favorites. Oh, okay. Okay. But yeah. Mostly because Tucker. I got tight with Elsie's husband, William, who was always in gold and seemed like a very weird match for her. Right. <clears> yeah. <throat> but somehow I got tight with William. Oh, because he was on the Dianetics running team. And uh, Melanie Peeler is just someone I always found so likable. Even as an mm -hmm. RTC rep, she was always so like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, so, I guess so adorable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she was sweet. Yeah. Yeah, I really liked Elsie initially and then she she was not very nice to me during that time at mm. Flag. I mean at FLO. Right. She did a lot of things that were like I don't know, kind of evil. <laughs> yeah. So when you finished whatever handling period you had there at the at middle management, were you in CMO or did they, you know, stick you down in the flag bureau or cause I, I was, I was, was under the impression that you weren't in CMO there. I was in CMO XU mm -hmm. and I was assigned to be a word clearer, which was like the dumbest post that was like made up. And how can you be a word clearer in CMO XU? It was like under like the staff, like bureau. So was, I was supposed to like, it was just a made up job for me. Basically. And it was like the worst made up job. Like I would have rather been like anything other than a word clear. <laughs> That's amazing. And so like I had this like little office, but there was a camera in the office oh, no. going to the RTC reps oh, God. office that was literally on me the whole day. It was directly from my office to the RTC reps office. Oh my God. Yeah. And then I just did like training. And then it, from that point on, I wasn't allowed to do any schooling from when I went to FLO. Is that because you were older than 16? No, I was 16. I was literally 16. But they I think they just decided like, I don't know, like they didn't want me to get involved with the other kids there because maybe like, like I became too friendly at flag when it was school time. Like, because I was in CMO, I, I was like, you're not supposed to fraternize with right. other people who are in lower organizations. And I was like the worst fraternizer there was, <laughs> not only with CERG members, but with outer trainees. <clears throat> I um, bet. I bet. Yeah. You no, know, so it's I, funny, though, because I always knew you. Um, I always knew you. Well, I only really distinctly remember you from the time in the Keto Life course room. And you were very kind of standoffish. It's funny to think of Jenna fraternizing with all the outer work trainees because that's not oh. the, that's not the Jenna I remember. <laughs> <laughs> really? That's funny. Well, I think maybe I was really nervous at first when I went there because that was like the first time I had been like, I don't know, I guess like around public and in a regular course room. Yeah. And so I was, I was like kind of scared. And then Diane was so nice and everybody like loved her so much. And I was like, I was like, fuck Diane. What about me? <laughs> 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 and, 
And my mom thought Diane was like so great and would always go on and on about how wonderful she was. She was the head of the cadet org and I was like a groundsman. And I was like, well, I'm right here. I was like, I'm your daughter. And I already <laughs> didn't see her that it was like even worse. It's like, I never saw my mom and I was finally get to see her. And she was like in love with Diane. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. <clears throat> okay. So, um, okay. So you're in CMO and all that kind of stuff. W what for you, like you'd already decided to stay after your parents left, right? Mm -hmm. What is, what, is there one thing or was it a number of things that something clicked for you that you're like, yeah, I don't want to be here anymore. Like at, mm -hmm. after going through everything you'd already gone through, what, what made you want to leave the Sea Org? Yeah, it was so many things. I mean, there were so many, I mean, I left when I was 22. So at this point I'm only 16. So that's six years. Um, but you know, in that time I met Dallas, we like went out to D we got in trouble, but by that time I had already been like taken away from everybody who I knew at flag and, I like was not going to accept this shit again. Like I was like turned fully psycho at this point. Like I was like, <laughs> no. And I was like the worst possible Sea Org member there could be. I And I had already done the PTSSP course, like been under watch, like 25th time, had a million sec checks by everyone in RTC. And I was like, this is not happening to me again, ever. But... <laughs> they always had a way to get to you and their way to get to me at that time was through Dallas mm. who had not been through all of that. And so he, you know, would be a good little Seerg member and tell everything that we did. Uh. And it was hard because I loved him so much, but I had no way of protecting myself in that situation, you know? So, just many years of this, we weren't allowed to get married because somebody in his family um, was like, had looked at some online website about Scientology. Anyways, I don't even know which part of the story to tell next, but um, just finally we got married and then we were like sent on a mission to Australia in 2004. We were in Canberra for a year. It was like an ideal org mission. We were supposed to like, help that org find a new building and raise all the money, even though there was like five staff members. <laughs> there has to be some reason they sent you guys off to Australia. <clears throat> I mean, I think that it was like just to get me away because like between everything that had happened with me in Dallas with us going out to D, I was like this like kind of rebellious person who like would like, I don't know, like I kind of wouldn't take very much shit from anybody. I don't know why, how I lasted in the Sea Org for that long, but to be honest, I think it was to be with Dallas. Hmm. And so I think they just like wanted to send me away. And, um, you know, because there was all sorts of things happening at, happening at the base at that time. Like, like people would like, so people would go to go home to go to sleep at midnight. Um, but in reality, we would just stay up all night, like for several nights in a row. Like I worked in the landlord office and like, and Dallas worked in Decem and it was like, we were just required to work all night for many nights in a row. And I would always be like, well, no, I'm not going to just stay up all night every night. If we, if there's something we need to get done, then we'll do it. And there would just be people marching around like, you need to turn off your music. You're not allowed to have snacks in your drawers. And I was like, just like rebellious. Like, I'd be like, no, that seems like a bullshit rule. Show me the policy where you can't have music on. And they'd be like, whoa. And then I'd be like, great, everybody turn their music on. And then <laughs> nobody would, of course. So I just always just looked like an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> but like, uh, so, so we got sent to, to Canberra and we were there for like a year. And that was kind of like the first time that I was like, around like kind of wogs all the time. Like we had to deal with these real estate agents. We had like an apartment. There was this other girl that was there with us. And I don't know, it was like the first time that I had been away for an entire year. And we made friends with a lot of the public there. 
Um, and, um, you know, there was like an OT committee and some people were on it. We became really good friends with them. And it was just nice to be around people in a totally different environment. Um, and so we were there for a year and then we went back. And then when we went back, it was like this stark, this huge difference in how things had been like, um, and we we're like back in hell kind of. So I can only imagine. I mean, comparatively speaking, <clears throat> being in Canberra must have been goddamn paradise. Yeah, it was. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we would like ride our bikes to the org and to the apartment and like we could eat food and <laughs> <laughs> like when we were hungry. <laughs> there were beds, yeah. blankets, <laughs> food, <laughs> shelter. <laughs> Yeah, and we weren't getting, like, yelled at and insulted all day, literally, or getting, like, weekly meter checks or doing, like, two and a half hours of study, getting study meter checks, getting all the things, you know? I forgot about the fucking meter checks, man. I know. There's so many little details that that are, like, everything, but you sound crazy if you bring them all up, but there's so many of them that they lead to this, like, crazy controlled environment but if, but sometimes like if you just focus on one, then it sounds like you're making a big deal about nothing. But there's right. so many of them. Yeah. When you went to Australia, <clears throat> did it create this sort of um, – did it start making you wondering, why is everything such hell at, at the Sea Org base compared to here where people are actually – getting things done i mean scientologically speaking orgs are is where stuff actually gets done does anything get done at middle management i don't know but at least at orgs you're like delivering scientology to people right were you ever like why is life better here than in the sea org base where everyone's supposed to be so sane and ot and on purpose and in ethics but here's where people seem to actually be happy right yeah i mean i didn't fully think that all the way through at the time now that I'm thinking about it we actually did like have some access to the internet though and actually I we did have we were able to call my parents who had left so I was actually in touch with them during that time Wow! and they had told me to go to the operation Clambake site they did yeah but they were like trying to be very like they would only say like they were very nice. Like it's it's very precarious when you're talking to someone in a cult, you know, like you got you can't like go full out against it because then you'll just trigger a defense mechanism. So it's like this balance of like being a safe person, but also like planting little seeds. Wow. And I think they did that really <clears throat> well. So um... they like I know it's not a question for you, really. It's more a question for your parents. But I, I would love to know how quickly they traveled that path from just leaving the Sea Org, but kind of maybe planning on being, you know. Actually, I wonder what your parents' state of mind was when they joined, when they left the Sea Org. Were they like, we're still going to be Scientologists? Or were they like, no, we're fucking, we're done, done? Well, I think, I, I don't know, like, for sure. But I think that they had to do, like, some kind of A to E. I know this for sure, I, I, but I don't know the direct answer to your question, but I think they had to do some sort of A to E in order to have any future hope of talking to me again. Oh, so they were, they were one of these unofficially declared people. Right. Yeah. Or, or sec secretly declared people. Yes. I mean, I remember asking Marty when they were leaving and I was like, yeah, but this basically means they're an SP, right? Because he had said, there, it's not declared. You guys, you can do courses in Scientology. I was like, yeah, but that this means that they're basically declared an SP. And he was like, basically. Right. Wow. So, so they had to do like some like unofficial like version of ADE. And because by this point, they had moved back into the States. They had moved to Virginia. Right. So, um they had to do some unofficial version of that to even be able to like, to talk to me. 
did they have to get permission to move back to the, did they, did they have to ask for permission to move back to the States or there, or were they eventually like, fuck you guys, we're going to do what we want. I think that it was the second one. Like they <laughs> said it, but they were like, <clears throat> like they said we're moving back, but it was like, and we're doing it. Like it was like in a way that it was like, and you, if you have a problem with it, then you better just fucking deal with it. Yeah. I see a comment here. I want to throw up real quick. Cause I want to ask you about it. And Rathbun is evil. I don't, uh, I don't know that I ever dealt directly with Anne and Rathbun. I remember at flag, I think the head RTC rep was Sue, um, Sue Wilhair. Yeah. I knew her as Sue Wilhair. There was, um, an, uh, a gentry. There was a Mr. Gentry. She well, that's very- all the same person. It's Sue Wilhair is Sue Gentry. She was married to and some she, dude on the ship. It's Jay. Oh, really? Who was the yeah. hot blonde for the hot blonde Swedish girl or whatever? Oh, Ricky Jensen. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, there was Alain Baram right. and whatnot. So, but someone like an Ann Rathbun, her name pops up in so many fucking stories. Is she one of these people that you you think is one of the like one of the evil kingpins of Scientology, or or is she someone who ever? Did you ever, does she have a real human side to her? Like, I, I don't have much re- frame of reference for her at all. Yeah. I don't know. I wouldn't say, I don't like, as far as like strategizing about all of Scientology, I would say no. But she's somebody who handles people who are in, who are important, who is like, has the ability to like tear someone apart piece by piece until they forget who they are and they're a shell of themselves. And I've seen her do that to many people. Definitely tried to do it to me, probably doing it to Shelly right now. And I do think that she's evil. I mean, I, I am more even likely to think that she's evil than my uncle. I'm not saying that that's true. I'm just saying like, like she just seems to like enjoy it. I probably shouldn't have said that, but anyways, um, she, um, I mean, who knows? It's hard to imagine being really, really good at something. Like when I say one of the names you hear all the time, it's like Greg Wilhair. The guy's mm -hmm. been there for like 40 or 50 fucking years. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've heard stories on how he really is incredibly incompetent and bungling and all this kind of stuff, but it's like to exist at that high level Mm -hmm. underneath Miscavige for Mm -hmm. so long, you mm-hmm. couldn't possibly hate your job. Like eventually you have to th- think someone like an Ann Rathman or a Greg Wilhair. They must take some sort of pleasure from their job or they would never last for that long is kind of how I think about it. Is that how you think about it? That is how I think about it. Yeah. I don't think that you make it to the top unless you're willing to do a lot of bad things and to throw a lot of people under the bus. I don't see... Like, I mean, I could have moved to the top in that way, but that wasn't, and by the way, I'm not saying that I've never done anything bad when I was there because I definitely have, but doing that consistently to climb and climb and climb, I don't really see how else you could get to the top, you know? Yeah. What about Tracy Danilovich? She is a fascinating one. I've never met her. I don't know her. The only reason I even know who she is is because when I when I was training at Flag in 96, Dicko was on the Outdoor Training Program, Dick Orchu. Right. I remember. And, and John Danilovich was the senior intern soup. Mm. And it felt so weird that Dicko's daughter was marrying Mr. D's son. It felt very incestuous. <laughs> <laughs> And that's the only reason I know who who Micho Danelovich or Tracy, you know, or Chu Danelovich even is. But apparently Tracy is, you know, the RTC rep for the F- ILO. Now it's called the ILO. Right. There is no international management. And basically Tracy, there, there's no, there's no, um, there's no like COCMO IXU unless Tracy, no, like Tracy essentially runs Scientology. Like you have Miscavige and wow. by all, all accounts, Tracy is international management. Oh, from, I was not aware. From out, like she runs, like she answers to no one. It's Tracy. She answers to Dave. I mean, could I be yeah. wrong about that? Yes, but from all accounts, it seems like that's that's what it is. What what is she like? What was she like to you? Um, can I frame the question a little bit better? Yeah. Melanie Peeler is someone who, to me, sticks out in my mind as no matter how much authority she really had. 
no matter, you know, she was an RTC rep. If you were in an elevator with her, whatever, she mm -hmm. was just a kind, sweet, nice person. Who was it was it's almost like she was in on the joke. Like, yes, mm -hmm. I'm a big deal, but I'm just a cute little person. Mm -hmm. You know, you know what I mean? Like right. at least and maybe the, maybe that's just a show that she was good at <laughs> at putting yeah. off. But she and always seemed like value. a genuinely sweet human being. Yeah. Was Tracy like that or is she like a witch? <laughs> Um, she was not like a genuinely, she wasn't a sweet person, but I don't think that like, no, she definitely was not sweet. Like if she was in an elevator with you, she'd be like, <laughs> but she was like more standoffish and introverted. But, um, when I was with her and also like, I definitely saw her be a terrible bitch, horrible person to many people. And many people swear that she's the devil in my experience she was very conflicted in my opinion she was very conflicted and um i think she was conflicted in her handling of me and i don't i honestly like yeah she she was i think that she liked me like i think that she empathized with me and she would tell me stuff and um yeah, but I mean, I do still think that someone who's like that is capable of doing very bad things. But um, yeah, she wasn't evil, in my opinion, in the same way Anne Rathbun was. Hmm. What was um, what was your experience with your aunt Shelley? I get so many conflicting. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I've spoken to so many people who have conflicting experiences with her, and that's to be expected, right? Because no one's the same person at all times to everyone. Right. Um, yeah, I think you generally hear her described as no matter what she was, she was at least the kinder, 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 gentler version of Dave. Mm -hmm. But it's almost like you couldn't help but be like, of course, like, of course, you're going to be the kinder, gentler version. What are you going to be the worst version? <laughs> I mean, I guess maybe Marty Rathman, maybe that's what Marty was. Sometimes his job was to be the worst version, but he's also a man like is right. Shelly, mm -hmm. you know. So what was your experience with Shelly? What are your th feelings and thoughts about her? Like I've had both experiences with Shelly. She's been very mean to me and very kind to me. And maybe some some of the times when I thought she was being kind, now in retrospect, I'm like, that's kind of like fucked up. But um, like, I don't know, from when I was little, um, Shelly would always like made me feel important because she would talk to me and she would ask me, <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't see my parents a lot. So <laughs> I have a low barn. <laughs> <laughs> She'd wave at me when I walked into the lunchroom. <laughs> no, <sighs> she would always call me over and sit there and talk with me for hours. Huh. And would ask me about my studies. She would like tell me stuff like she was like super into health. So she would like tell me like, this is healthy, this isn't. And I was interested in it too. Honestly, I was. <laughs> and um, what, what was she big on? Bee pollen and niacin? What, what were the? <laughs> no, no, I don't. It was like all, I don't, it was just random stuff. Like she would tell me stuff like, don't wear clothes that are synthetic because that's not good for you. It could get into your bloodstream. Don't use deodorant with aluminum because that can leak metals into you. And then that goes in your breasts and then you get breast cancer. Or she'd be like, don't eat pot potatoes. Aren't good for you unless they're raw. Like I even have letters with this shit in it, but I, so it was all like random and confusing for me. I didn't know like the through line. <laughs> So, but, but I, so this was mostly though when you were a child age, not when you were like a Sea Org member, right? Actually it was both. Oh, she wow. was, yeah. And so she, um, like, it was just that she thought I was important enough to talk to. I didn't see my own parents that much. So like if I was working in like the bakery at the base when I was at the ranch and like, she saw me, like I would get, like, she would pull me into her office and she would show me her dogs and she would show me around and then everyone would be nice to me. And at that time, Anne Rathbun was like my uncle's communicator. So she worked in his office and she was like, so nice to me. I was so cute. Hi, Jenna. She was like, I was like her favorite. But then the second you're on the outs, this woman is like 
she's like the devil, Professor Umbridge, anyways. Um, but and then later on, when I was at Flag, when I was in the Sea Org, you know, Shelly was the same way. She would call me into her office for hours, would ask how I was doing. She cared a lot about my school. She tried to get me to do this like one kind of math that was like you do it all in your head or something. And like, I think that she had like a maternal thing towards me. And but it was a little confusing because then she would always be like, family isn't real and no, no, um, Thetan can be the parent of another Thetan. But then it was confusing because I knew that like she was my aunt. She wasn't calling every. It was just like all this cognitive dissonance all the time. It was just nice that someone was being nice to me. That's very somebody who was important. Yeah, On yeah. One hand, she's telling you family doesn't isn't even real, but she's showing you special treatment as a family member. Right. Yeah. Oh. Or, or for another reason, I don't know. Maybe it was. I don't know how she dealt with that in her head. But um, and she also didn't have any kids of her own, which is always an interesting dynamic. Yeah, yeah. I genuinely think that she really loved me. Like, mm. and she said things that were messed up to me. But I think that that was her way of showing love. Like, it was like almost like in the Sea Org, if you put someone's ethics in, you're helping them, you mm. know? So she was like definitely a true believer. She definitely like believed in L. Ron Hubbard. And, um, and I think that she like wanted to like mentor young girls and mm. I don't know that's the idea that I got from her and then also I would get in trouble and she would be very mad at me sometimes when you when you were in that period of um I'm just going to call it the routing out period whenever you and Dallas were because mm -hmm. I assume it wasn't a fast process did Dave or Shelly ever reach out to you to try to be like hey look just just knock it off come on uh, da, 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 da. or were they hands off uh, well, hands off to me, but I think that behind the scenes, like that wasn't the case. They were involved. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you know, those, yeah. Yeah. Did you feel like their involvement is more like, uh oh, we better handle her to stay or was it like, let's just get her out of here as, as, as fast as possible. Cause it, it's interesting to me that they, they sort of shifted from the first stage of almost telling you, you had no choice. You had to go with your parents. Then you're yeah. like, no, I'm staying. You stayed for six years. But by the time you wanted to leave, it's not like they were like, guys, she should have left six years ago. Just let her go. They were trying to hold on to you. By the time I left, I think that they were like, not really trying to hold on to me, but they were trying to like get a dig in there. Like they were trying to separate me from Dallas. They did try to convince me to stay initially, but then like, I was like, like they were like trying to take away everyone's cell phones at FLO. And I was like the last person to not have to still have my cell phone. And then like me and all these people were like, I was like, don't worry. Like we're going to all have it to the end. We're not going to let go of it. And then I was the last person. They all fucking threw me under the bus. And, <laughs> and then it was like, became this thing where I was like, no, if you take away my phone, I'm going to call the police. Like I was like taking everything very far because I was wow. like so done with it. Like I was like, like just so much had happened. So much had been taken away from me. I was like exhausted. I did not give a shit. I like... I was not going to take it anymore. And I was just, everyone was just like always against me. Like I was always like, no, people should not have to scrub dumpsters with a toothbrush if they fall asleep during the L. Ron Hubbard lecture. And then it became like, I would get called up. It was like getting called up in front of the whole muster that I was like worse, the back flashy person. If, and I like said, no, we can listen to music. Like it just became like they were taking away things that yeah. were like just to be evil. Like, what policy says you can't have music? What policy says you can't have snacks in your drawer? You know what I mean? So it's just like so obvious that it was yeah. just to take things away from people. Yeah. And then every like muster of the day, the head, like the, the commanding officer was telling everybody that they were a suppressive person. All these people who were working their ass off and had been dedicating their lives to Scientology for years. She was telling them that they were all SPs, 
And I was like, that's not even like per Scientology policy. Like <laughs> that's not even possible. And it was like, like it just became like, like so many times I almost stood up and was like, this is bullshit. This is not true. And then it was just like, okay, nobody agreed with me. Nobody kind of had my back. So it's like, I just need to get out of here. Like I can't continue to be here anymore. And so they were like trying to make me get a sec check. And I like had had so many sec checks. Like, honestly, like I had like upwards of like 20 sec checks when I was in the Sea and I had just had so many. I was so done with it. I like literally could not take it anymore. Like I, I can't even explain. I couldn't even explain to myself logically in Scientology language why I couldn't take it. All I knew was that like my body would not accept me participating in this anymore. And then Dallas had said that he would leave with me, but I had to get through my sec check first. Mm. So it was sort of like, kind of like throwing me out there to like take all the crap <laughs> and then, and then that's what happened. And so I was trying to get my sec check and then I just wasn't cooperating. I couldn't do it anymore. I just like, I, I couldn't look for another withhold or in another past life or earlier similar. I was just like, I, I couldn't be in the auditing room. I would try to leave auditing rooms. People would try to like hold me down. I would wind up like running down the back stairwell. People would be chasing me. It was like a whole big mess. Like, like I should actually have blowing, the, like actually blowing the auditing session. Yeah. A lot of times. No. A lot of times. Yeah. I've never even heard of that. Really? Oh my God. They're like, Jenna's on the run again. Lock the doors. Oh, it was like that. Like I would like, like, well, there's a camera on you the entire time. I would try to leave. Like I even like the last time that it happened, I like crushed the cans. I like <laughs> threw my PC folder up in the air. No way. I was fantasizing about doing <clears throat> that for so long. Like I finally just did it. It was like just papers everywhere. Yeah, I had to fight to get out of the room. And then, and there's like so many rules because it was like disturbing other sessions. So it was like, this was like so, a million high crimes that I was committing at this time. But it was like, I just couldn't do it anymore. And I had to run to the back stairwell. And then there was like other people, security guards, like racing to, to beat me to the stairwell, meeting me at the bottom and me like just running out at the last second before they could catch me. And like screaming on the street, leave me alone. At which point they just like leave and are like, we can't create a scene. We can't create a scene. Oh and then of course it's God. all stupid because where else do I have to go? Was this in your book? I think so. Oh my God. I've never heard of something like that happening. Yeah. At the end I was just like done. So, and then. Wow. Basically, like Dallas was coming home every night and he was um, like, he was like, yes, just get through it and then I'll come with you. And then he started like coming home later and then he started not coming home. And I would be like, and he started being like, I was like, are you going to come with me? And he was like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. I was like, what do you mean you don't know? Like, this was the this is why I agreed to do this. We were both going like he genuinely wanted to leave too. And then, um, and then it, he just started like becoming more and more distant. And then finally it was like, he's not going anymore. And I was like pissed off and upset. I was like, I loved him. I was like, you were going to come with me and you change your mind. And he was like, he didn't want to like not be able to talk to his parents again. And then they were like, they asked me to sign like an NDA and I just like shredded it. I was like, go fuck yourself. I am never signing this. I was like, they're a nightmare. I was the worst. <laughs> and then they were like, Dallas, you need to just send her to the airport, put her in a cab. And they like, wouldn't even like let him say goodbye to me. And then he um, he was like, no, I'm going to take her. I'm going to. And then like the girl from Osa was like right there with us the whole time, like wouldn't let us have five seconds together because we were married. We had been married at this point for four years. And, and then when we finally got to the airport, I was like, I remember something Greg Wilhair had said to me previously. He was like, 
It was when we were getting handled at an earlier time. He said, he was like, look, Jenna, we only care about what's happening with you. Dallas can just be thrown to the sharks. Like he's basically like, we don't give a shit about Dallas. We only need you to be okay. He said that to you? Yeah. And for some reason at that time, I was like, if I leave him here, I'm doing something bad. Like he's just going to get treated terribly. And I... And so I was like, look, I'll stay. I'll stay like long enough. I said this at the airport when I was going on about to leave to go to my parents' house. And I was like, I'll stay with you. And then they were like, he, when I told him that, he said, okay, I've been talking to Mike and to all these people from OSA and whatever. And they've been telling me bad things about your parents and all this stuff. So he had been being like, Mm. dealt with by them for weeks and had been like sort of convinced which by the way Mike has told me all of this and he's apologized and he's done like many things like you know for my book he helped me to tell this story and what was happening behind the scenes so there's like not hard feelings there but um and then they were like and so when Dallas told me that I of course was like pissed off and then they were like, basically, they were like, now you both have to go. Like, they're like, she can't stay. So then that's when we finally. Left. Oh, my God. <laughs> they, they, they hit you with the Uno reverse card. They're like, <laughs> oh, you're staying? Fuck that. You're both leaving. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. But then we went to San Diego where Dallas's family lived. And I guess they didn't want us to be there because they were Scientologists, they thought we were going to my parents' house. So they like packed up this whole like U-Haul truck and it was like the most bizarre inventory that Give I've ever seen. Give me five seconds my... while I replace my light. This is a, oh. a ritual we have here. Hold on. I can still see. Everybody take a drink. <laughs> it's a drinking game when my lights go out. Um, okay. I mean, this is fucking amazing, Jenna. Okay. So you're like, I'm staying. And they're like, fuck you. You're both leaving. And then you're like, psych bitches. We're not going to Mexico. We're going to San Diego. Yeah. Uh, how are you even allowed to make that decision uh, to go to San Diego? Well, my parents were actually in Virginia at this time, but oh. we weren't allowed to make that decision. We just did. Like, I guess, like, as far as I was concerned, like, when they take everything away from you, like, you had nothing else to lose. So, so they had Dallas to threaten me with, but nothing else. Like, what, what were they going to do? Like, I didn't care. It already been done. There was nothing else. I was like, I go where I'll go where I want to go. Right. <laughs> you know, but Dallas I wanted do to what go to I San Diego. Do. Yeah. Well, actually, I wound up going where Dallas wanted to, to San Diego. Did you want uh, to go to yeah. Virginia at that point? No, I didn't go to Virginia. No, did you want to at that point? Did I want to? Um, I did, but did you I have your heart know. set on Mexico? Like, like other than San Diego, where did you? Where were you wanting to go? Or you oh, really... out. I did not care. Oh, I didn't yeah. even think about it. I just I was it. like, I think to my parents' house was like just to like have some peace. That's yeah. the only place because I, I didn't know anybody else really. Right. Right, right. And so we went to San Diego, and um, then that became a huge, like, so we had escaped, essentially, but then it just became years of Dallas's family trying to stop us from, trying to have us go back into Scientology, have us pay our freeloader debt. So many years of that, just right after having left, and then, and then having us not speak out about Scientology, Dallas was, like, wanting to pay our freeloader debt when we first left. I was like, I was just like exhausted from convincing any more idiots that, <laughs> that I didn't want anything to do with them. Wow. You know, I think, I think it's going to come as a shock to many people that, that even since your book came out, you've had people in your immediate family who've been against you continuing to speak out in any way. Like almost they're ashamed 
it, it, is that is that how you would describe it? Almost like how do they describe why they looked down upon you? Speak was it shame? Was it your 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 out ethics? Like I, I don't quite get it myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Dallas's immediate family, his parents were still in Scientology when we left. Right. So it was like. We were like threatening their bridge. We were like, I was stopping their son from achieving total freedom. Their whole business was run on Scientology. It was like this whole wise thing. They had an org board. They had like wogs who worked there, like writing OWs and doing conditions. And so it just like threatened their way of existence. It and this was, the, this was the jewelry business? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so Dallas's brother is Barney. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And their dad is, was Gary. Yeah. How does Leo Hamill fit into the, is he, is he a family? Is he just a friend of the family or was he part of the family? I always get that. Oh, they were business partners. Was Leo yeah. and Gary business? Okay. I get it. I get it. I get yeah. It. Yeah. Leo started the jewelry store and then I believe he met Gary at flag and then he liked him. And then he said, come be a partner in my business. And then I think he like gave him half of the business, like out of the goodness of his heart. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. So then, so obviously if they're still in Scientology, then you've got that huge push and pull bullshit, but yeah. then you write the book and that's nine years ago. By the time you wrote the book, was Dallas's family already out of Scientology or did your book kind of drag them out of Scientology? It kind of dragged them out of Scientology. Like as I was writing my book, like, Dallas told my dad that I was going to be writing a book. And he said, well, as far as I know, Jenna doesn't even have a story. And then the entire time when I was writing the book, he was telling me, look, Jenna, I know that you don't agree with certain aspects of Scientology, but I don't want you to say anything bad about the tech because the tech itself is good. And like, he was just like in my ear about it. And Ooh, Dallas or your dad? No, Dallas's dad. Oh, Gary. Yeah. Ugh, wow. Yeah. So. Wow. And I believe like at that point, like his or I don't remember if it was after or before um, my book came out, but like his parents had been working at a company that was run by Scientologists and like they got fired. Mm -hmm. um, so. um yeah, yeah it was that's all. how they put the screws to you. Messing with yeah. family. Yes. Yeah, exactly. They get something that you care about and they control yeah. you with it. That's what happened to me. Right. And essentially it was just through Dallas, basically, you know. Wow. So then, but even in the after, like you, the book comes out, even mm -hmm. after that, they're like, eh, don't keep doing stuff like that. I mean, at that point, they weren't like, telling me what to do, but they were never happy about my book. Hmm. They never acknowledged like, oh, wow, what you went through was crazy. Hmm. They never apologized for how they had treated me for years. Hmm. And there was just still, and then there was this air, like, I think in the end, Gary wanted to do something about it. Like he was like, he wanted to either talk about it or get their money back or something. And uh, Dallas's mom was like, just don't rock the boat fighting. We don't, we don't have the energy to fight this. And it was sort of just like looked on as like, like you should just like go live your life now and you don't need to fight. And it was always just like, Oh boy. I knew that wasn't <sighs> true, but also like, just I had been through so many tough situations that it was just exhausting for me to fight anymore. But, you know, it's one thing for somebody like if I'm like, OK, I need a break from fighting. But it's another thing for somebody who has never been in the cadet org and who has experienced Scientology at as a public at the benefit of little children carrying their folders, serving their meals, little 16 year olds like me, you know, to say like who, who are separated from their parents to say like, 
okay, don't talk about it. That's different than, I don't know, that just is another level. That's like willful ignorance. Yeah. You know, um, I've been seeing some of these programs that have been, <clears throat> well, that Mike took with him when he left these mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of pages of OSA documents. And some of these programs, there's one in particular that was written, written about Chuck Beatty. Do you know Chuck Beatty? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know him personally, but I know <clears throat> him and I've like communicated with him. Have you, have you happened to seen the program I'm referring to or seen the video I did about the program? I haven't. No, I've seen ones though that relate to my situation. I was thinking of referring to them earlier because you had asked about our, the handling when we were leaving and there's, messages between like essentially Mike and Dave yeah. about us when we were leaving. Oh, I'll tell you the, the reason I'm mentioning the program of Chuck is I was just so struck by program uh, targets in this program mm -hmm. as detailed as um, they had some PI who was literally mm -hmm. one of Chuck's best friends and Chuck had no idea that it was a PI oh. have the, I think they would say the SF resource have the SF resource Feed Chuck ideas like, Chuck, it's not really worth all the trouble. Just mm. move just move on. Like, isn't this mm. just a waste of time? Like, wow. you're never really going to be able to take down Scientology. Like, do you really want to uh, – don't you have more – uh, some things in life that'll bring you more joy. Yeah, that's how it was. Yeah. Attacking Scientology. And I'm just saying, I'm not saying, I'm not saying, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just think, I just start getting this conspiratorial idea of Scientology going to Dallas's mom. And again, I'm, I'm pulling this out of my ass, okay? Mm -hmm. And being like, hey, we'll give you this money back or whatever if you will just feed Jenna these lines of, you know, just just be a mom, just, mm. just, just, just do art or whatever the fuck, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying that's what was happening, but it's like, right. it sure is it wouldn't it surprise sure is what Osa would have wanted to have happen. Right. Right. Yeah, totally. I mean, they were in touch with Osa after we left all the time. And like, we had to move, oh. like, with, at that time it was like with like Tommy Davis and then like Jenny Linson and Angie Blankenship. We like, the, and then they were like reporting to Kirsten Catano from OSA. So they were like, but I think that, yeah, I mean, that's definitely within the realm of possibility. Who knows? If you ever come to visit Clearwater, we'll have to go ambush Angie Blankenship down in one of the bars at the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Does she work there? No, she just goes there to drink all the time. Be like, oh, okay. surprise, bitch, it's Jenna. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no one to Angie. She just knew me as some <laughs> stupid kid, but oh, <laughs> I'm yeah. sure you know Angie much more than I do. For sure. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> I know her sister too and her brother and her her mom was really good friends with my grandma. Who's your grandma? You mentioned her before. Oh, yeah. Uh, Loretta Miscavige. She's she's dead. But so she this was, was really. So your, your dad's mom. Yeah, my dad's mom, and she was, she was married. Here in Clearwater, she was in Clearwater. Yeah, when I was there, so from when I was twelve till I was sixteen, she was a public. Oh, and I had no idea. Yeah, like so, if I ever had like libs day off, I would be able to like go with her, and we would like she would take me out to eat or like take me to the mall. She was really sweet. I really loved her so much. She was like, she would like give me an Easter basket. Like it would like appear at reception. And I was like, like, I never had an Easter basket before. So it was like, so like, even though I was like in CMO and I was like, whatever, it was just like, I would get, all I really wanted was an Easter basket. I didn't even know it was Easter. So it was like this awesome surprise. And wow. um, yeah, if like, so she was like the family that I had when I was in Clearwater and sometimes she would be on course. And so was I, and it was like being on course with my grandma. That's wild. Yeah. You know, I, uh, you said something earlier that um, when you went to the middle management, FLO, ILO guys, mm -hmm. guys, uh, the, the acronyms for different yeah. Scientology Out organizations have changed over the time. So middle management used to be called, the FCB, the Flag Command Bureau. And then it was changed to the Flag Liaison Office, the FLO. And then it was changed to the International Liaison Office, the ILO. So, but you mentioned getting to the ILO and now, you know, the kids 
the kids, you know, weren't either did school once a day, uh, once a week or couldn't do school at all. To you and I, that sounds normal. To the rest of the world, it's like middle management was staffed by high school age teenagers. <laughs> You're like, yeah. yeah, that's who's yeah. running the fucking show. <laughs> that's true. Or at least some of them. <laughs> yeah. There was like all ages. I would say if there's something that I sometimes miss about there is that like it was like normal to be friends with like young people and really old people, you know, like just having that yeah. variety of people. Would you agree? Uh, I'm telling you, this is how I feel. I'm wondering if you agree. As a young, as a teenager, 13, 14, 15 specifically, because those are the, the year, the ages I was training a fly. There was a real sense of liberation and freedom to be treated as an equal to all the adults. I don't know. Did you feel that way? Um, well, I had never had it any other way. So like um, at the ranch, we were like, like there was the head of the cadet org. They were like, we called them sir and mister. And like, if I was the head of a division, I was called Mr. Miscavige as well. And I always had a job like a job and would do the deck work. And so I was never, ever not treated like an adult. But when I talked to my mom who like went to a regular school and then her family joined the Sea Org when she was 15, she said that one of her things that she really liked about it was that she was like not treated like a dumb little kid, that she was like given a job and given value. And I can totally see how that would be attractive. Like, I think my daughter right now, she's like, no, I don't want to take out the trash. I want a real job. She's like, I want money. <laughs> and she's only 11. So I think that there is some value in that, that appeals to people. Wow. That's another incredible example of different childhood experiences in Scientology. If all you've ever known is being treated like an adult and therefore it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily feel good. And yet my experience of being in public school until the sixth grade, we did homeschool for the seventh grade where like being treated w not only as an adult, but also with respect, because like, mm -hmm. like as a staff member, it's not like all of a sudden you were treated like a piece of shit. Like, you know, like you hear the horror stories, like mm -hmm. actually treated with respect. And also as you would know, as a child on full-time training, you're mm -hmm. treated like you're so fucking valuable. Mm. No, it's different. You you like you have stories of kids being put to work on the on the uh, the e meter assembly line, and you're like, that's a see that that's that's a, just a perfect example of two completely different childhood Scientology experiences. Something I found valuable wasn't even on your radar because it has had always been that way for you. Yeah, but you are right that like when we like when we got to work at the base and make e meters, that did make me feel important. Like because before, oh, you did like that. I did. Well, it was, well, we were inside in an air conditioned space where you we usually were working outside and like, you know, like raking gravel or planting trees or doing something. So it was like much easier, much easier without question. And we were like sitting down while well, our work involved sitting down, which was also crazy. And then we were like with adults listening to music and like on the assembly line, we had to do things that were complicated that, but that, they were no, they're no big deal to us. They weren't too complicated for us at all. And then like every time an e-meter went through the production line, there was like a bell rang and we we're like trying to meet this target and everyone cheered. And so, yeah. Wow. Were you guys like so using soldering irons and shit? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We would like make the circuit <laughs> board. So that's where I started. Like we would like make the circuit boards and then there were people that were in assembly who put all the pieces in. Then there was like a calibration department, people who did all these little tests on it, hooked it up to different machines. And then there was the sealing department. And then, and then actually way before that, there's the plastics department. And then, then it would go to QC. So I like actually worked in all of those. And then at the end I was in QC and then there was even like preps, like, like packaging them and like, putting them in boxes. Wow. Yeah. Kids are making these machines that Scientology is selling for $5,000 a piece. It's <laughs> <clears throat> absolutely fucking incredible. Yeah. I even remember like gluing on the little like quantum thing. Like there was a gold plate in the back and this like plastic thing that went on it and it was like 
difficult to like not get a bunch of glue inside there so that it like looked like <laughs> and so like even just putting that on yeah. at the end okay you just you talking about the e-meters and the mark super seven quantums and the golden age of tech just reminds me of what was the name of the young little girl who was in the golden age of tech event oh. video ha lauren ha hollander ha yeah was she a cadet with you yeah, she was. She came to the ranch much later than me. But yeah, she was she was a cadet. I have always wanted to find that event video. Never been able to find it because it it it, it it's you couldn't have a better piece of evidence for how children are expected or valued to do auditor training with adults where literally the video that mm -hmm. Scientology produced for the new auditor training system featured mm -hmm like an 11 year old girl. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, okay. When you left the Sea Org, mm -hmm. was it difficult to have a relationship with your parents? Um, when I first left, no, I mean, they were in Virginia and I was in San Diego. Hmm. So I think there was a few years like with my parents, you know, where it was um, like just like they were we were able to speak openly to each other about all the things that went down. And that was really nice. And then after um, several years of being in San Diego and it being really difficult with Dallas's family and after our son was born, we moved to Virginia and that was a bit difficult. Like it was a bit like, I don't know how to explain it. Um, yeah. I mean, just the family, there was really good times and there was difficult times, but in the end, I think I didn't realize it, but I was just surrounded by people who had been involved in Scientology that I was like, not a believer. Oh, whoops. I was not a believer. And um, I, I don't know, like if I didn't, if I didn't like that environment or I wouldn't get along with them, I always just like believed that it was me and that I was like, just like mm -hmm. a bitch or unlikable or whatever, or I was doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. But like, I don't know why I wouldn't, why I would be so stupid not to realize that it's actually all these people were involved in this thing yeah, and we just see things very differently. Did you ever have to deal with your parents still trying to push Scientology shit on you? Like were they independent Scientologists? No, they weren't ever that, but people who are like them, I think there's certain things that they think that they don't even oh, realize right. Right, right, that right. are necessarily <clears throat> from that, like a way of thinking. And even if it's not like, Scientology directly it's things that you have to believe in order to make what happened okay right did you guys as miscavages was there some I'm, I don't know if I'm using the right words here but some some type of self-awareness where it's like where it was extra weird that so at this point it's you it's your dad it's your mom it's your grandpa you know Ronnie senior your grandfather it, it, was it like, hey, are we all going to acknowledge the fact that we're all miscavages and we're out of Scientology? Like, it makes it extra fucked up. Like, like, like any other group family leaving Scientology could be like, we're former Scientologists, but they can't go. We left the church, and our family member runs the damn thing. Like, mm -hmm. was, um, I don't even know how to frame this as a question, but do you kind of understand what I'm asking? Yeah, I totally understand what you mean. Yeah, I mean. So like by the time my grandpa came out, I was not living in Virginia anymore. We had moved back to San Diego. So not really. I mean, I mean, I guess there was my mom and my dad, me and Justin and Sterling. But I mean, I guess we didn't really need that reassurance because we already knew that it was fucked up there. Like we were already like none of us needed to be sold on that really. Some people leaving Scientology struggle with whether what's wrong with Scientology <clears throat> mm -hmm. is because of L. Ron Hubbard or because of David Miscavige. Right. A lot of people did, do. 
But did but did you guys as miscavages struggle with that less or more than your average bear? Hmm. Were you like, no, it's definitely because of fucking Dave? Or were you like, well, Dave's bad, but it's it's really LRH? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't think I don't know. That's a good question. I actually think we might think different things about it. Hmm. Like, I think that it's all of it. Like, it's not only Dave and it's not only L it's just they're all fucked up. The whole thing is fucked up. I don't think that it was like, OK, when it was when it was just LRH and then now it's just only bad because of Dave. That's ridiculous. You know, well, sorry for people who think that everyone's <laughs> point of view is important. <laughs> no reason to apologize. But yeah, yeah. Um, but um, I because think Jenna, that it is pretty crazy, right? Mm -hmm. That there's only one Hubbard left in all of Scientology and every other Hubbard has left. And there's only one Miscavige left in all of Scientology and everyone else has left. And it's incredible that Scientologists as a body don't seem to go, what the fuck is up with that? <laughs> That's true. But I don't think, I don't know if they know, I don't know what they know because like when my parents had left, I was required to keep it a secret. I was not allowed to tell anybody. It was like this big secret. Like even when I was together with Dallas, he was always like, well, ask your parents if we can get married. And I was like, I like couldn't tell him I would. And like I told my other friend. You couldn't even tell your husband they'd left? No, I did tell him and oh. got in trouble, but I couldn't tell anybody. It was like this big secret that I was always keeping from everybody. So they didn't want that knowledge out there. Like, in fact, when I called Benjamin that one time that I'm referring to, like when I when Mike had left, I had said, just so you know, the reason why I left Florida was because my parents had left. And he was like, oh, I thought it was because you did something like whatever. So nobody knew that that was why. And when I was getting declared or getting a comev, Dallas's dad wanted us to go get a comev. It was like, I did not want to go get a comev. It was like, anyways. So I went there and... um what was I even talking about? I got so annoyed by that. <laughs> <laughs> that fucking comev. That I know. Um, you, you, that you weren't really allowed to tell people that your parents had left. You called oh, Ben. Yeah. Ben didn't know. Right, right. Okay. When my comev, when mine and Dallas's comev came out, like they just like sent it, like they just addressed it to a few people in pack or like whatever. And I was like, no, I want this to go to everybody. I want everybody to see it. And there's even some communication in those documents that we were talking about earlier that came out that that is me being like no I want you to send this to everybody and they're like we don't know why she wants this maybe she's trying to get some kind of special treatment or something but I wanted everybody to see because I I know a lot of people in Scientology I was at several different bases and I like had a lot of people that I was friends with or that I remember I wanted to plant that seed of doubt in their mind I wanted them to see that Jenna Miscavige who they knew Maybe they are not saying like everyone loved me. I'm just saying who they knew. I wanted them all to know that somebody in this family was getting declared. I even said I wanted them to put Miss Scavage on the Comev because I wanted people to see because that's the type of thing that I would think that would plant a little seed of doubt in people's minds. But I think they just like issued it locally, probably didn't issue it to anybody. So probably put Jenna Hill on it, right? They did. Yeah. Yeah, but there's this going. whole communication where I'm like, I want you to put Jenna Miscavige, that's my legal name, and I want you to issue it to everybody. And they're like, should we do this? Why is she saying this? <laughs> <laughs> they're like, this is some kind of Jedi mind trick. What is going on here? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <sighs> Does your, uh, I mean, are you close with your parents? I've never asked you. Um, I speak with my parents and I'm close with them, but I wouldn't say that it's like, I don't know. It's not like how I am with my kids, Yeah. you know, but we have a good relationship and like we, we talk to each other, I guess. So. Do they have a problem with you speaking out? Uh, no, they don't really. Yeah. I think that 
I think that um, sometimes they see things differently than me. I mean, mostly my dad sees things the same as me. I think sometimes my mom had a, like a little bit of a different experience than me growing up where it wasn't, but she acknowledges that it wasn't as bad for her when she was younger. Um, was she like raised in Scientology? Was she raised in Scientology? Your mom? Yeah, I think, I don't know what, like, at, like, I think that her parents became Scientologists, public Scientologists, like they read Dianetics this might be wrong, but like around when she was 10 and then around when she was 15, they all joined the Sea Org. And on that point, it was like a boat that was not the Apollo. It was like some other boat name. Mm. And then they wound up all leaving and she wanted to stay kind of like what had happened with me. And so when that time came around, when I wanted to stay, she said that like, like she felt like and, and I believe that she was right, that if they tried to make me go with them, that it wouldn't have wound, it wouldn't have ended up very good. I do think that she was right on that, even though that's controversial. But um, so she had had that experience before and she wow. stayed when all of her family had left. Amazing. Now, <clears throat> it's funny, whenever I hear stories of um, how old Dave was when uh, he got into Scientology. It's funny. I never hear sh the, the, the stories always center around Dave. It never centers around Ronnie, your dad. So, mm -hmm. but you, so your dad must've been like, I don't know, 15, 16, 17 or something by the time when, when his folks got into Scientology, right? Like how many, how many years older is your dad than Dave? Well, I think Dave was born in 60 and my dad is born in 57. So I think like three years. Oh, that's it. Okay. Yeah. I see. I, I, I and so, okay. So your dad might've been like 15 or something. Yeah, right. Yeah. He was in high school. Does he ever tell you crazy stories or is that not necessary? Because you already know all the crazy fucking stories. He does tell me crazy stories and he has, but he's told me I hear so many crazy stories all the time that my mind is like, There's, everything's just crazy. <laughs> That's why I'm so excited about you having your own channel. I hope you just tell stories all the time. <laughs> <laughs> People love stories. I love stories. Oh my God. That's I love true. Stories. I love stories too. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like, but he doesn't have LRH stories, right? Cause they didn't work with LRH. I mean, even Dave hardly worked with LRH. Did your dad work with LRH? I don't think so, but I'll have to ask him directly, but he hasn't <laughs> mentioned it in the way that my mom has. Did your mom work with LRH? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. See, all the stories that people tell are always just about Dave. I've never heard any stories about Ronnie and how he rose up through the ranks. And I, I, I never hear, I've never heard any of Ronnie's stories. Yeah. I mean, I guess like growing up, I wasn't around my parents a lot. So I did not hear a lot of these stories at all. Like I didn't even know like how my parents met or anything like that. I didn't know anything until like a little until after, but that just everyone else knew. And then there would be things that Shelly would tell me that I just like would come out of nowhere. So, yeah, I, I don't know everything like, wow. yeah, but I'll, I'll have to ask. What year was it that you routed out with Dallas? At the end of 2005. That was after Shelly was taken off post. She was taken off post sometime in 2004. Did right. you, was, was that on your radar at all? Um, it was a little bit on my radar that I hadn't seen her. There was one time I'm trying to think if it was before. Yeah, it was before I went to Australia, but like Dave and his whole entourage came into the landlord office where I was working and Shelly was there and Lou was there and they both recognized me and they like said hi on the side and Dave came right up to me and he was like, do you know where uh, the landlord, I, the landlord dude was whatever, some dude. And I was like, yeah, he's right over there, sir. And then I don't think that he recognized me. No. I, well, I did see him later. It was when I was going to Australia because shortly after that I was leaving to Australia. So I don't know if it has to do with that interaction or what, but I saw him at, in the HGB and he said, Jenna, he was like, oh my God, you look so different. He said, 
And I was like, yeah. And he's like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm going to Australia. And he's like, oh, that's great. And then Shelly saw Dallas or something and asked him, was like, you're still here? Like, I thought you were supposed to be gone or something. Like, something like that. Anyways, yeah. I don't know. Wow. But that was, so Dallas actually saw her and it was the first time he had met her. And she was like, Oh, it's nice to finally meet you. Um, so that was Dallas meeting Shelly. And this yeah. was, are you saying that was 2005? No, I think it was 2004. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, um, Larice, Lou, these people to me aren't real because I've never met them or known them. They're just faces I've seen in photos and, and names. Um, but, you know, you hear some whispers that perhaps Lou and Dave are shacking up, hooking up these days. Do, do, do you put any stock in that? Do you think that's possible? I mean, I have not in a position, been in a position to see why people might think that. Like, I don't see them together. I don't like, I don't know. I, I It seems crazy to me because there, there wasn't like anything there when I was around them. But yeah, yeah. anything's possible. People working together, you know. Yeah. The two, be. the only two anecdotes I can point to is Leah at Tom Cruise's wedding. I think mm -hmm. she reported seeing Lou sort of smack Dave on the butt a little, or pat him on the butt a little bit, which seems weird. Mm -hmm. Like that's not something Sierra members would do, even if they're married. Like, um, mm -hmm. I mean, like that's not married. Sierra members don't exactly do public displays of affection, really. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other thing is, I think Mitch has said that he was flying on Tom's jet with Dave and Lou and Dave and Lou retired to the bedroom together. And it's like, does mm -hmm. that necessarily, who knows? I don't, I don't know the dynamic. I don't know how it works. I don't know yeah. if it should be like reading him a bedtime story. I don't fucking know. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I honestly have no uh, idea at all. Yeah. Um, what do you make of the whole Shelly thing? Um, I don't even know how to ask that question any better than that. Yeah. I mean, I do feel worried for Shelly. I feel sad that she's still in there. And I feel like like I do wish she could come out. And I guess I also like, like, I guess I'm also kind of like, where's everybody else? You know, like, because I have so many other friends in there who were in there since they were little kids. And who, you know, I wish they were out as well. I wish they had the same freedoms that I have. Or I, so I'm like kind of unsure on why specifically Shelly, although she is a public, I guess was a public figure. So I also do wish that she was out. I just don't want to only give her importance because she's Dave's wife and not give importance to other people who were nobodies because they didn't have that same important position because they're all somebody's and they're all important. And they all, many of them grew up in the same way that I did. Right. And don't have anybody asking after them. Yeah. I wonder sometimes not just even about the senior execs that we all know, but, but their kids or whether they even have kids. Like, are you like, um, I met when I was in Italy, um, uh, Guillaume's daughter, Laura, Laura, Chiara. Laura. Oh, okay. I never met Kiara. Is it Chiara or Kiara? Kiara. I've never met her, but I met Lauda. And, and to, for me, as a kid growing up in Scientology, the mm -hmm. fact that Guillaume Lacerve has two gorgeous daughters out of the Sea Org and mm -hmm. Kiara has kids and he's got this whole fucking family he could be enjoying. And uh, from what I understand, Guillaume even comes from money. Like, it's not right. like, oh, I can't leave because no, like, Guillaume could leave. Yeah. And he could have a life and a family and he's, fucking doesn't um yeah. like does mark yeager have any kids I, like i've never known these people right so i don't know does mark yeager have kids no right. no he doesn't yeah it um, is crazy though like ray did ray minoff have any kids he didn't did he no he didn't but like greg wilhair has got kids everyone knows darius wilhair you know right that's greg true wilhair yeah. could have a, a life a family instead he's gonna work for this fucking cult until the day he dies it's like really sad yeah that is really sad. It's true. And, and even the kids we grew up with, Diane, I've, you know, I've heard Diane, Diane Rhodes. I've heard not only is she still in the Sea Org, not only is she still in CMO, not only is she still on that same post of like senior CS chief, CMO Clearwater, whatever the fuck, 
She's never yeah. even been married from what I've from what I've been told. She should so- consider herself lucky. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. No, no, I totally feel terrible for Diane. I feel no, but I mean she's a 40, 40 year old virgin, is what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, right. Good point. Okay, I did I did not get that. I see what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think of that. You're totally right. Yeah. And I feel worse for Diane too, because like, I don't know, Greg will here. I mean, he got himself and his kid into that, you know? Yeah. And I still think that he deserves empathy as well. But Diane was like, just like born into it, brought into it by her parents, you know? And, and, and like Greg will here in some ways has had access to the outside world where yeah. Diane really hasn't at all. Not at all. Yeah, and Dusty, like Dusty's got to be dead by now, right? Her dad's got to be dead He has by to now. be, yeah. And, and probably so, her mom, too. They were much older than her. Yeah. So everyone she's ever known is a Sea Org yeah. member. She has yeah. no family anymore. She has no spouse, so she has no mm-hmm. in-laws. She's got nothing, and she's never been laid. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Poor Diane. That sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Even though I was really jealous of her yeah. for absolutely no reason, she's totally a sweet, sweet person who everybody she... loved. Yeah, it sucks. That's the type of thing that makes me sad. <laughs> People I knew at the ranch that are still in there. Yeah. Anyway, I really think that the more people, because I consider like we're sort of the same generation, but mm-hmm. but we know completely different people. Like, yeah. We hardly have any like we only have a small bit of overlap between um the people who know us, right? That's true, but I think I know quite a lot of people because I was at Flag. There no, but that's what I mean. That, yeah. No, but but that's what I mean. I consider us the same generation, mm-hmm. but our <clears throat> the sphere of people who know us are both very large but mm-hmm. very different. Yes. And um the YouTube thing is super interesting because people connect with YouTube. People connect like like uh, uh, seeing people have chats like this is different than reading a book or watching a TV show or, or watching a documentary. It's so right. much more. It's so much more real. I think you're going to be inundated with people reaching out to you who've never spoken out before. Is my I, I really think so. Well, that would be wonderful. That would it's, be amazing. Yeah. Uh, it's I think it's so 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 important and awesome. Um. <clears throat> that people aren't going to have to ask anymore. What the fuck happened to Jenna Miscavige? <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy too. Yeah. I hope, I hope people start asking, what the fuck happened to Astra Woodcraft? Like, <laughs> and, and I'm sorry, what was the name of the other girl who started the website with you guys? Oh, Kendra. Me. Kendra what? I think it was Wilkerson. Wilkinson, uh, Wilkerson? Wilkerson, I think. Wilkerson. Yeah. Yeah. Like um, that website is still up, right? Xscientologykids.com. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it needs a little update. I got to get on that. What was what was the reason for launching that website? What did you guys have in mind? Um, in fairness, it was Kendra's idea. And mm. she did a lot of the heavy lifting. But it was to give people who were who had grown up in Scientology who were kids to give them a place where basically they don't feel alone. <laughs> There's other people out there who've had similar experiences and answer questions for them, not just for outside people, but for them, like, you know, like I remember when I left, I was like super afraid, even though I knew it was ridiculous about like the whole OT3 deal. I was like, okay, I know that that doesn't logically make sense that I will like, my mind will like be blown and that I will be like permanently handicapped if I learn about this, but I'm still kind of scared. Cause like, it's not reversible if this is true. (laughs) And so I think like, you know, a lot of those questions are answered in a very gentle, relatable way. Um, And um, people could just talk about stuff in the forums and it just gave people a place to like, feel like they weren't alone. You know, they weren't crazy. I think that's what's so important when people leave is. Yeah they have not been validated for how they have felt about this their entire life. They've had to push down their feelings, confess them as overts. They've been told that if they matter, that it's because they have, they've done bad things. So 
it was just like a safe place for people to finally be validated. People who are probably still have like their mom in telling them that they're doing something horrible, just a place where there was other people like them where they wouldn't feel totally fucked over and alone in this world. And um, yeah. That's awesome. Well, I hope YouTube becomes like the next chapter of that effort. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, it used to be that all the, all the communication or the chit chat amongst former Scientologists was always in writing on these forums, these blogs, these, mm -hmm. you know, groups and everything. Mm -hmm. And now people can just um, chat. Yeah. And talk about chat. it themselves without yes. any gatekeepers. You yes. Know? Yes. Yeah. I agree. I love that you're empowering people to do that. I think it's so important. It's, I think it's and so, so smart. important. It's, it, 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 it's hard to even emphasize how truly important it is that pe you don't have to go to someone else. Do you want to tell my story? It's right. Like, oh, what about Tom Cruise and David? Exactly. Uh, they only the tell like the least important part of it. And then you were like, why did I? take so much time talking to that person. And then it just becomes this stupid thing about Tom Cruise. Yeah. And then other people who are waiting to see it are like disappointed because they're hoping that it gives them some relief or makes them feel some sort of recognition for what they've been through. But it's just made to be, I don't know, like to get clicks or something. So I think that it's, it's really good that you're pushing this and, I, I want to contribute to that in some way. Like I feel a lot of empathy for people who have left, who don't have a family, who are still struggling with, you know, how they have been taught to treat themselves and how they have been treated their whole lives. That stuff doesn't just go away, you know? So yeah. I hope that I, I want to help with that in some way and empower those people who are like me. I have so much empathy for them. And I just want them to feel heard and important and included. And I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to do that yet, but that's, that's what I, that's the direction I want to move in. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I really do think you're going to, you know, see a whole bunch of people coming out of, uh, <clears throat> coming out of the woodwork. I don't, I don't even mean that like dismissively or derogatorily, but people yeah. who are like, it, it's also one of the reasons I've, I've, I've wanted to try to, um, get people to understand that doing a YouTube channel is, is it might seem intimidating. It might seem like people always go, what could I possibly have to offer to the conversation? And I go, what the fuck are you talking about? Your experience. Look at me. I yeah. was never an int. I was never, you know, I, I like everyone just has their own experience. And um, absolutely. Yeah. And, and everybody's story is important and being an int does not make your story more important. The breadth of experiences from all over the world paints a picture of the whole thing that was going on and everybody's story is important. Yeah. Hey, I think people are probably going to wonder, I get this question all the time. How much, how, how much of the bridge did you do? Oh, okay. I was a class four auditor, but I started my internship, but I never finished it. And Same. then I like did up to grade. I didn't finish grade two. <laughs> This is, the, this is the reason for everything. I got <laughs> up to grade two, but didn't finish it. You're I didn't flat. start you're, it. You're mid grade two. That's the why. <laughs> it's so funny. So you spent your entire life into science. How old were you when you ratted out? Uh, 22. 22. And you never finished grade two. You know, I I only finished the Purif. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, that's hilarious. But you were trained. I know you were. I know. I know. But like, I have never even done the objectives. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Dang. I did the Purif like three times. What? I didn't even yeah. do the Purif until I was like 22. And I, I so I just oh. did it once. How the fuck oh. did you have to do the Purif three times? Okay. I did it once when I was nine because it was like way better than all the work that I would have to do. And so I did it, but it was like so hot. I was like, the sauna was like 160 degrees. I got bloody noses every day. And then I like hid my vitamins in a shed, like where no one could find them because I couldn't take all those vitamins. So whatever, when that was done, then the oh. next time I did the Purif, I was at Flag. 
And it was because my brother, Justin, was on the RPF at FLAG. And I had heard that he was on the PRF and I had no way of talking to him. So I like concocted this whole plan to say that I never really like had the end phenomena of the PRF and because I never took my vitamins, which was true. And I said I had bloody noses so I could get onto the PRF. So I did the PRF again there, then never saw him. I ne it was like all for nothing. He, I wasn't, they did the, the people on the RPF did the PRF at night, apparently. So I had wow. to do the PRF again for no reason. Even though, to be honest, like for me, the PRF was kind of fun because you could like read a book, even though I was dying. The whole, it was too hot, but yeah. And then I did it again wow. later at FLO. And I don't know why that was. Wow. Um, okay. So how many siblings do you have regardless of whether they're quarter, half or full? So there's Sterling Tompkins. Mm -hmm. um, just so do, how many siblings do you have? I just have two. And those people are Sterling and Justin. Okay. So Nathan is not blood related to you. Right. Yeah. He has a different mom and dad. Okay. okay. But he's also, he's their half brother as well. Right. Do you know, for as long as I have known Sterling, I haven't even really fully understood that Justin exists. Like, oh. <clears throat> and I always think of Nathan as being sterling's fraternal twin mm. <laughs> because i've never met or seen or spoken to justin i like i have to be reminded that he exists yeah and it's so weird because they're twins like yeah are, are you disgusted that these twins were ever separated because i'm thoroughly disgusted i am i mean yeah and not only that but they were like one twin was taken with one parental group and the other one was taken with another so neither twin had access to their mother or their father. Like that shit ain't right. I don't care whose choice it was or whatever. Yeah. You can't just, and yes, they were together at first, but actually for many years, Justin lived in New Hampshire with my mom and dad and did not see Sterling wow. who was in LA. So I, so when we moved back to LA, I remember meeting Sterling. It was like meeting Sterling. He's your brother. And I was like, huh? I was like, Sterling, my brother, like, so, so yeah, not only that they were separated, but they were both separated from their other parent. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. I, <clears throat> I feel like one of the most destructive things Scientology does to its members, to society is the destruction of the family unit. I mean, you, you can probably make a pretty long list of destructive shit that Scientology does, but the mm -hmm. way they just discard and destroy and minimize family is so antithetical to what traditional religion is usually all about. Usually religion mm -hmm. is about, I, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to overstate it, but it seems to me that usually religious folks value family. Yeah. Like they can get them all in together. Yeah. And yeah. we're not, and I'm not, this is totally separate from what happens when members of well, families leave religions. I understand that every mm -hmm. religious group can be uh, terrible to people that leave. Right. Scientology is the only so-called religious group that I can think of that is ha minimizing and destructive of the family unit when everyone is a member. Right. Yeah. That's what's hard to process. Yeah. 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 That's true. Do you know what <sighs> I mean? Yes. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, how'd you enjoy this first YouTube chat? It was good. It went awesome. It was easy. <laughs> I was really worried. I was just really nervous. So this was easy. It's just a conversation. Yeah. Well, this was great. This was awesome. Um, <clears throat> all right, everyone. Well, shit, we've gone for two and a half hours. Why don't we, uh, oh. why don't we, did it feel like two and a half hours? <laughs> no, it didn't. I can't believe it's been two and a half hours. Actually, I'll tell you what. Let me let me pull up some of these some of these comments here. Not all of them okay. require responses necessarily, but mm -hmm. um, anyway, let's just go through them. Pat Shore, Aaron, make sure you're prepared for the storm. Oh, I thought I thought Pat, I thought you were saying like prepare Jennifer for the storm. Pat's talking about the actual hurricane that's heading towards Florida. Oh, <laughs> oh, okay. Is it there a bad goes. one? anything now it's it, at most it'll be a category one which is for us a stiff breeze 
and uh, <laughs> and it, it never actually hits us anyway. But school's yeah. already been canceled for Wednesday. So oh wow. Uh, let's see. Lisa Marchbanks, welcome, Jenna. We're so glad to have you join the SPTV family. Sending you lots of love and looking forward to all your coming content. Thank you. Uh, Arnie Van Halen, Jenna, your book is definitely in my top three. Yours, Mike's, and Mark's. Much love from Sweden. Oh, thank you. That's so sweet. Uh, Dave Owens, the in this interview and Reese's call and Reese's calls. The oh, the recorded phone calls really highlight the massive human damage this cult causes. I'm glad Jenna and Reese are now finding peace. SPTV forever. Um, I'm curious. Do you um do you do you hesitate to call Scientology a cult? Like, do you try to use nice words to be nice to Scientologists, or do are you like fuck that? I don't care. Oh no, I oh. No, not to be nice to Scientologists. I just like, yeah, I do struggle with what to call it. Some people I'm like, because it's like when I was in the cult, it just sounds like people like laugh at me and be like, I can't believe you just said that. <laughs> so like just sometimes like, I don't know if I'm in an interview, I call it the church. And then sometimes I call it the cult. I don't know what to call it, to be honest. I'm still figuring it out. Yeah, yeah. All right. Pat Shore says, hey, hey Ron, you got to send Jenna an SPTV mug. Oh, I should send you a mug. <laughs> Actually, if we, I can help you get your a merch store set up. I can send you all the designs for this stuff too. You can have all this stuff in your own merch store. Oh, cool. Um, let's see. Uh, door handle. Question for both. Any tips on planting seeds in a family member that is in the Sea Org so they could escape? I don't know. What do you think about this? I don't know. That's so hard. I mean, I think that like the stronger, like if you have any connection, like like the best thing you can do is maintain it. Like the nicer you are, the more of a safe space you are for them, the more likely that you'll be the first person they think of when they're ready to leave. Like, so even if you don't even directly talk about it, like just being a safe place is everything. That's right. I totally agree. Annette Ferrone. So happy to see you, Jenna. Found and read your book last year. Mm -hmm. I'm an I'm an ex-paying public Scientologist, believed in it for more than 35 years. So happy to have found you all speaking out. Thank you. That's hey, sweet. do you have some email? Like if people want to email you or message you or reach out to you, is there a way for them to do that that's open to the public? Um, I have that Jenna at xscientologykids.com. I just need to make sure that that's working still. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. Um. You are enough, says Susie Q. Sorry you've been through so much trauma. Yeah. That's do you <clears throat> do you find it um um do you find it difficult to talk about your own story much? I mean, I know you've written a book about it, obviously. But like for me on my channel, you'll notice I never talk about my own story. Probably because yeah. if I did, like how many times can you tell your own story? Do you find it hard to talk about? Like my brother, I can't talk about really. So I don't. Um, like you don't talk I, about it because it's upsetting to you? Mm. Is there any part of your story like that? To be honest, like, no, because it's like, just was normal, you know? But I completely empathize with you. Like, I really do. Yeah. It's just like, it was just every day, you know? Yeah, yeah. Makes but, sense. Yeah. All right. I'll, you'll Jenna. be on my channel and we'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. We'll see. Um, thank you so much, Jenna. Says Jen Hack. You're brave. You're beautiful. We all appreciate you sharing your story and love your humor and strength. Oh, thank you. That's Have you spent a lot of your life with people telling you you're just a bitch? It seems like, be, like you, you sort of mentioned that. Like people always like, oh, yeah. you're just being a Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or like you just if I just, such a handful. <laughs> I don't know. I don't even think I was just like even just like standing up for myself in any little way. It's like that's bitchy. Like it's better just to keep the peace. And to be honest, like I don't I'm not mean. I'm nice and I'm friendly. Like I genuinely love people and care about them. But also like I I, I have not been lately, but I have always been in the Sea Org somebody who's like that's not okay. Like I will not, that you can't treat me like that, but it's never been in like, you're a piece of shit. You deserve to die. Like, it's not like that. 
it's like, right. no, these are my boundaries. So, but yeah, I think and being told there that I was a bitch all the time. I was trouble. I was like, whatever, but you know, they're benefiting from telling me that. Well, so now that I think about it, that's something that you've always been fed from people who were trying to control you and couldn't. Yes. Right. right? Exactly. Yes. All the time. Right. 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 Incredible. Did you ever have juniors in the Sea Org? Not really. I mean, when I was at the ranch for like a very short amount of time. So like at the ranch, there was cadets and then there was pre-cadets and then there was children. So there was like different age groups. The children were the youngest. So like Lara, when I was at the ranch, was a child. So for a little bit, I was in charge of the children's group. I was like responsible for making sure they like did all their hygiene things that they did their work and that sort of thing. So that was probably the only time I had juniors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> but it is adorable. Um, yeah. No, it's funny because it's hard for me to, to, to think of C or like people who came out of the sea org who just like, it, how, how do I, how do I say this? You've had this run on you for an awful long time. And Forever. it's only dawn, dawning on me that it's because like, like the, 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 uh, to think about you, like leading the, the cell phone revolution in the Sea Org, like you will not take our phones united. We stand <laughs> like it's so goddamn funny. But like it'd be I'd, it'd be I'd, I, 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 I don't imagine that the people who you were trying to help at that time would be the one, you know, trying to criticize you for being such a bitch. You know, they'd be like, no, she was fighting for us. It's always been the people that were like, Jen, you know, who could not control you. That have been right. running running that narrative. Totally. But even those people who I was like, felt like I was like trying to go to bat for them, they would have had to, in order to deal with it, in order to continue to stay there, they would have had to have been like, well, Jenna got into my mind and she told me that I should have this. And it was because she influenced me and I really just wanted to give it away, but she made me, you know, so right. it's like their mind is being messed with as well. So it all comes out to the same. Jen is a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and then I guess your in-laws are kind of like, look, look at you making our lives so difficult. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yes. I mean, that's how my in-laws were to me as, as well. Although they didn't say it to me, they said it, to the videographer for the videos on my website, but <laughs> sorry, but I guess it's different being a man, right? Cause they're like, just like Aaron's bossy and mean, and it doesn't have the same stigma as Jen is such a bitch. Right. That's you know exactly I mean? right. If you're a woman and you stand up for yourself or you're assertive, you're a bitch. I feel bad that I keep using the word over and over again. <laughs> Fine. Oh, oh my God. No, you don't have to apologize to me. I mean, <laughs> um, all right. Pat Shore says, Jenna, did you get fair gamed when you wrote your book? Also, did your family ever talk about Shelly's disappearance to you? Okay. So we spoke about the Shelly thing. Yeah. Do you got it? Do you have a hate website up? I don't, but I did see the other day that there is a website. I don't even know if I, but that's like, jenmiscavige.info that was purchased by somebody in Clearwater, Florida. So we'll <laughs> see. It's probably coming. But no, I didn't have one. But we were fair game. Like we were followed by PIs. Even for a time, there was somebody lit like a friend of Dallas's from the Sea Arc who came and lived with us for a few months who, based on those documents, I think was a spy. Who was and it? His name was uh, Matteo. He was Italian. Mate not Matteo Gabbiati. No, I don't okay. think he was only at FLO, but he was like, wow, you think he was spying on you guys? Yeah. <clears throat> based on those documents. I didn't think so at the time, but um, yeah. And then like, we like had, um, you know, people trying to meet with us or they were meeting with Dallas's family, trying to get us to take down, um, like to stop the nightline interview that I did to right. stop all sorts of different things we were doing. And they were basically like using Dallas's family disconnecting from us as a weapon to get us to shut up. Wow. Um, are you going to do videos about those programs? 
oh, I mean, I could. That's a good idea. That's one idea. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mark Headley, the cracker liquor himself. Jenna, you did amazing. You will kill it on YouTube. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Lydia von Sretschklaw. Jenna, our SPTV Nation loves you. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Joni Cummings, Jenna, love the interview and welcome to um, YouTube and SPTV. We love you. That's sweet. <laughs> okay. When you said you smack, you crushed the cans, like with your hands, with like Thor strength, or like you jumped on the cans, like what did you do? <laughs> so, like the newer cans, they weren't like the ones with the S in them, they're like the ones that you plugged in. Okay. So I just like threw them on the ground and stepped on them. Oh, you stomped on them. Okay. Yeah. Cause it was like, they couldn't make me pick them up again. If I did that. I've literally <laughs> never heard of anyone doing that. That is incredible. I and fantasize I just, about it for so long. Th throwing the PC, did you like grab the PC folder and just fucking chucked it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've been wanting to know what was in there for a long time. And I even saw a few things and they were not nice at all. But I remember yeah. when I was getting sec checked by Ann Rathbun, I would just sit there like fantasizing about, I was like, there's a window behind me. I could just take the whole meter and throw it out the window. <laughs> and I was like, what if I hit someone? And I never did it. And I'm so mad that I never did that. <laughs> it is hilarious to me to imagine you just fantasizing about that shit in an audience session. I've never had such thoughts. What if I chuck that fucking meter right outside the window? That's <laughs> but but I you know you probably had like twenty times more sex checking than I've had as well though. <laughs> and from an RTC rep, that would be so intimidating. I I couldn't I couldn't deal with that. You know, in fairness to like everybody else, like the people, like like I had grown up around these people who were senior executives who were equivalent to my mom. And I still saw my uncle as a God and very important person, but I knew that the rest of them, like I could see them get in trouble occasionally. I knew that they got in trouble like the rest of us, but I still respected them. I still was afraid of them. But by that point, I, if like, I knew one thing for sure, it was that RTC cared less about the tech than anybody else in the whole of Scientology in this year. Like they like would op answer their phone when I was on session with them. Like they did not give a fuck at all. What? So, yeah. So I, yeah, like they literally, like nobody cared less about the tech than RTC. Nobody. Uh, that is incredible. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe that's why I was like, having those thoughts and other people weren't, you know, uh, it seems like this is a, a random thought, but do you think if Dave and Shelly had kids of their own, they would be different human beings than they are? I mean, I don't know. I, it's, mm -hmm. it's just a random thing. Like, like it yeah. just occurs to me, like they, they don't yeah. like you, for your father, the way the stories that you've told your father mm -hmm. seems to have had a, a unique awareness and care Mm -hmm. for the parental, the child parent relationship and your experience. I mean, and, and, and I'm not trying to, you know, <clears throat> gloss over anything, but yeah, yeah. No he seemed to be uniquely aware that there was something important about this relationship. Mm -hmm. Whereas David Miscavige by all accounts, doesn't even like kids. Right. But I will say that he was very nice to me as a kid. He would like, come up to me, make jokes. He was, he was very nice to me. I think he liked like having me around when I was a kid. And I remember he would come to the ranch um, and they would like, everyone would prepare. Like th there was like this whole rumor that he would like walk into a room and feel the wall and he would know if it was white glove clean or not. So we were like, had to white glove everything. And then they like, like wanted me to go up to him and be like, hi, sir, would you like some lemonade? And I was so like, I did that. And he was like, you don't have to call me, sir. He like saw right through all of this. He was like, you don't have to call me. Sir. So I do think that he does like kids or hmm. he liked me. Hmm. He, and I, and I think that he liked other kids, but I do think that what you said is very insightful. Like, I think that seeing kids and liking them is different than having your own kids. Yeah. And I absolutely do think that he would be a different person. I mean, you would, you would have to be 
if you had a kid of your own. I'm not saying he would be perfect because there's plenty of examples of many Sea Org parents who suck. <laughs> but um, I, I, I imagine he might feel a special fun. kinship with children since um, he's about the same size as them. That's, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> 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 you cracked yourself up on that one. <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm waiting for everyone else to to laugh, and I'm like, you know, I've never been close enough to Dave to actually understand his size, so I just mm -hmm. absolutely love making fun of it. Um, He's always been taller than me, still is. So <laughs> it's not the same. You're shorter than five one. No, he's not five one. Are you he's sure? Like five four. Are you sure? Yes, I'm positive. Who who's um I thought it was okay, so 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 um, it might even be five five. Whoa now, hold on. Okay, probably five four. We'll just um, go with that. I'll tell you the only information that I have is someone said he was five. I think it was some interview that Claudio Lugli did, and oh. someone said is Miscavige five three. And I think it was well, five three with the lifts in his shoes. And so this this has been um, gradually over time whittled down to five one. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I'll yeah. take your word. How tall are you? I'm five two and three quarters. Oh. So. <laughs> and you're telling me that Dave is taller than you. He's taller than me, yeah. Wow. For sure. Yeah. I'm gonna have to amend. I'm gonna have, well, you know, because we call him four foot thirteen just to be really funny oh, about okay. it. Yeah. You're making me feel really tall right now. <laughs> <laughs> Is it possible that when Dave was around you, he was wearing his Tom Cruise elevator boots? It is possible. Yeah. But his twin sister, Denise, is 5'4". I don't see what are the chances that he could be shorter than her. I don't know. Have you ever seen that movie Twins with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito? <laughs> <laughs> All right, maybe he's not five one. God damn it! God damn it, Jenna. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. <laughs> um, here's an interesting question. Um, Kathleen says, "So nice to see you here, Jenna. Have you told your kids some of what you went through? Loved your book. I'll tell you, Jenna. Our kids never even heard the word Scientology until the um, the TV show came to film in our house. Did oh. you ever talk to your kids about Scientology? Yeah, I talked to them about it. Yeah. Yeah." Um, yeah, I also felt a little bit like I had to because other people in the family still believe in it in a way. So, uh, and also in many cases, they were like, when I went on my book tour in New York, they were with me when we went to Poland, they were with me. So they were like there and they were, um, had questions and stuff and, and it's impossible like not to talk about my past. Or to say anything about myself, like because I was—that's my whole upbringing. So if they're like, "Mommy, what did you do when you were in second grade?" I was like, "Well, there was no second grade." <laughs> so yeah, they're in—they're very interested in it, and wow, um, yeah, wow, wow. Um, at this point, like my, my, you know, my oldest is in high school. Actually, my two oldest are both in high school. Mm -hmm. Their friends love watching my videos. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Like my oldest will sleep over her friend's house and she's like, dad, we just watched your videos for like hours. I was like, that's <laughs> so, I'm so, I'm so touched. I'm like, yeah. do they want any merch? I'll give them merch. Oh, uh -huh, that's cute. I mean, it's a part of society, you know, cults, abusive relationships, you know, people can get into work situations that are complicated. So it's, it's good to be like educated about it, you know? Yeah. Even situations where you even like little family situations, you know, it all has some of the same inner workings, the same like group think situations. Yeah. You know, we still live in Clearwater, right? So my kids sometimes make friends with kids in school who mm. are Scientologists. Oh, wow. And I got to be like, oh, I got to go. Do they know who we are? Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't think so. They definitely don't. The otherwise, like, they would not be allowed. I'm like, are you going over to their house? And they're like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, you better be careful. Like, because I don't want them to have their heart broken by a friend disconnecting from them because of who we are. 
Exactly, which has you know, happened. Yeah, I don't tell them like, oh, Scientologists are evil and dangerous. It's like, yeah, no, but you have to understand what we're dealing with. It's a little different. And right, like, this I might know, happen. I guess that's not a big problem in San Diego since there's like 16 Scientologists in all of San Diego County, right? Yeah. Well, there was the San Diego org, but. Um, I know, but those orgs are so empty. It's a joke. Yeah, totally. Yeah. No, uh, definitely not a problem in their school yeah. at all. Barbara Mangano, two inspiring SPs. Thank you, Barbara. Um, Jennifer Burke, uh, Tassie Devil. Welcome to SP TV Nation, Jenna. We never ends have got your back. Oh, just, thank you. Just call it Scientology. Oh, okay. I don't know what that means. Oh, oh, means oh. Like when I was in the cult or when I was in Scientology. That's true. That's that's what I say as well, actually. Okay, yeah. that's good. Sometimes I don't want to like announce that in a public space. Though. I'm like, when I was in Scientology. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. No, you never want someone to overhear that shit. <laughs> You're like, I'm not anymore, though. <laughs> <laughs> it is funny sometimes just to drop in a social setting. Oh, I wouldn't know anything about that. I grew up in a cult and people are like, what? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's more for comedy relief, really. Jackson <laughs> yeah. is in the chat. Hey, hey. So you knew Jackson when you were in, right? Because he just uh, like oh, out of the corner of my eye. I was young. Oh. Yeah. Oh. And I left the ranch before um, the other kids did. So they left three years later. So they would have maybe had a chance to get to know him more right. than I did. Yeah. But I know who he is and I remember right. him. That makes and sense. I remember his wife. Oh, yeah. Did you see my video <laughs> where me and Jackson talked about Barrett Oliver and all that shit? Did you see that? I'm going to have to no, send it to I you. No, I want to watch that, though. I remember. Did, did you know Barrett Oliver? Me? Did you know Barrett? Yeah. He Well, he was at the ranch when I was there. He was like in the Campbell house. I don't know what they were doing to him. But... Oh, that's because he was basically on. Um, he was in ethics trouble. He was on watch out there. Yeah, yeah. For a long time. But did you know him as the never ending story kid? Yeah. You did? Well, that's what that's what we all knew. Like he was like an actor, he was like famous or something. But had you seen the movie? Yeah, I saw the movie. Yeah. I, I I'm fascinated by the fact that the whole time I was in Scientology, I never knew that the fucking never ending story kid was a Sea Org member. I feel oh, like I I've been that. robbed. I've been robbed. Like <laughs> I knew that, but I don't. But I barely remember the movie because I think it was like over my head or something. I just remember that big like snuffleupagus thingy, that big the flying, like the flying dragon, the disgusting flying dragon. Yeah, it was terrifying. It was terrifying. <laughs> OK, I thought yeah. I was supposed to be cute, but I was like, maybe I should watch it, though. Is it good? It, it's aged well. It's okay. aged well. Okay. <laughs> okay, Mark has a hilarious merch idea. You have to have Can Crusher merch. <laughs> maybe, maybe one of the most baller moves I've heard of to this day. Yeah, that, like stomping on the cans with your feet in session. Like, <laughs> this is not the session, bitch. It's so funny. That's so funny because before, you know how before they start a session, they would always be like, is there any reason not to start the session? And I would always be like, yeah, I don't want to. And they never like knew that they would just do it anyways. But I always said a reason not to. <laughs> yeah, no one's ever given a reason. It's like you're not supposed to give a reason. That is so funny to me. <laughs> that's that's why people are like, we don't know what to do with this one. <laughs> you know, amazing. All right, Mark says yes. Claudio Lugli has confirmed that he is four foot thirteen. <laughs> he wears lifts in his shoes. Jenna is taller than him. Claudio made his clothes. He would know the real measurement. I feel like yeah. Mark would know too. Because... That's the thing. That's the thing. You'd think yeah. Mark. Yeah. Like, and also wouldn't you, people would recognize like when I see Tom Cruise wearing his boots, I'm like, yeah, there's a reason why you're wearing the same boots in every single photo. They're your elevator boots. Right. People at Int would know if Dave was always wearing his magic boots. Oh, that's what I'm going to call him. Dave's magic boots. <laughs> but I wouldn't have noticed. Cause I was just like, everyone was taller than me. Right. And also Sea Org members don't wear boots. They wear dress shoes. But I guess you can wear lifts in your dress shoes. But to have two inch lifts, that's a lot of lift. Yeah. But he was rarely wearing uniform. Oh. Yeah. Huh. Did he like wearing jeans and boots like Tom always does? He did wear jeans. I don't know if he was wearing boots, but he wore jeans all the time. It's Dave's magical boots. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, uh, Barbara says, my husband said you pronounced it right. <laughs> uh, there's an ongoing joke about me not knowing how to pronounce Barbara's name, last name. Oh. <sighs> All right. Well, this has been freaking awesome, Jenna. Thank you for doing this with me. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And thank you so much to everybody for listening and subscribing. It means the world. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Aaron, for helping me out. My really? pleasure. Before we let me show everyone once again, Jenna Miscavige's channel at Jenna Miscavige on YouTube. Oh my God, you're 10 people away from hitting 10,000 subs. <laughs> and let me pull up your book again. Jenna's book is Beyond Belief My Secret Life Inside Scientology and My Harrowing Escape. I hope you sell a ton more of these books. Oh, thank you. All right, guys. Thank you for joining us. As always, thank you to everyone who watches until the very end. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Okay, if you want to see my rock and roll songs, click right on this guitar. And if you want to see a, a different one of my videos, uh, then you could click right inside here. If you have subscribed or not, 